The opinions and views expressed in the following program are those of the speakers and the host and do not necessarily reflect those of Yokely Scott Corporation and your sports network. Yeah, I've been closer to Jesus before. So can you help me out? Can you help me out? Am I on my own? Am I on my own? Or can you help me out? Am I on my own? Am I on my own? Or can you help me out? Welcome into a Monday edition of Running Point presented by Greenwood Chevrolet on Mahoning Avenue in Austintown. If you're in the market for a brand new or slightly used automobile, do yourself a favor, do your wallet a favor, and head on over to Greenwood Chevrolet on Mahoning Avenue in Austintown. they got a great sales department, a great service department, and a great finance department, and let's face it, You need all three. Seriously, you need all three. Sales department so they don't sell you a lemon. A finance department so you don't pay out the wazoo for interest rates. And a service department because, well, your baby's going to need an oil change, tires rotated. uh, And if you happen to uh, dent your car, well, uh, your baby's going to need fixed. And that's where the good folks at Greenwood Chevrolet on Mahoning Avenue in Austintown check in. Uh, Ron Pochesta with you in my Penguins gear. Anthony Hartwig in his Royals gear. How are you, sir? I'm good. How about you? I, I can't complain. I mean, I uh, had a crappy week, uh, a weekend, I should say. I mean, it was uh, it was tough watching that. I was um, I had buyer's remorse. Not really buyer's remorse because we didn't put any Skittles on this. Uh, but you and I talked on Thursday. Hey, that Matsuyama guy, um, he was 50 some to one. Why didn't we, uh, why didn't we jump on him? And as it turns out, Hideki Matsuyama, Tomo Arigato, uh, he wins the, uh, he wins the masters. Uh, yeah, that's uh, a really cool picture of him in his uh, green jacket today. Um. Man, the, the, his ending to Saturday's round really propelled him to that win um, because he was 700 through, like, I mean, maybe 11, and he just went boom, boom. The, 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 the last stretch of that round where he went from 7 to 11 and really took, I, I think, a four-shot lead into Sunday, really big, really big for him. Yeah, it was a... Um... It was certainly a, a, an interesting last couple of rounds, and it looked like after 16, he was going to fall apart. His lead was down to two shots. Uh, actually, 15, I beg your pardon. It looked like he was he was set to fall apart. Uh, Shoffley had uh, caught up to him and, and was two shots off the pace and was really bearing down. Uh, and then Shoffley put one in the drink, put another one into the woods, and wound up triple bogeying the 16th hole. Matsuyama wound up bogeying it, so the lead went back to four, and that that was it. It was clear sailing after that. Right, right. And and our guy that we both picked, ooh, did he tank bad on Saturday? Wow. He had an awful what three or four holes that just yeah it was destroyed any chance he had. It was tough, and then he he just he didn't look good on Sunday either. So uh, it is what it is. Uh, it just then, uh, a, you put Skittles on Patrick Reed, didn't you? No, no. Thankfully, I, you I did down not. And did because it was no. Like... Thankfully, I did not. But I did put Skittles on Shoffley Sunday. Uh, I I said, you know what? I don't think Matsuyama's going to win this thing because he has a tendency in majors to blow up on Sunday. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna Skittles on uh, on Shoffley. And I got to be honest, I for a while there I was like, okay, this this might work. 
Uh, and then 17, where he was the one that got blown up. Because uh, he normally doesn't, he no, normally doesn't screw up. Well, early in the front nine, he had two double bogeys, which really uh, turned his round to crap. And then uh, in the back nine, he really struggled. So uh, it hit hit about four straight birdies to get to within two, and then on 16, it just fell to hell. How was your tally on the uh, the pickup? I wound up with 60 points, which was which nowhere near had, the money. Sorry. Yeah. It's what you've had during the show on yeah. Thursday. Nowhere near the money. I was as high as 90 points, which would have put me not in the money, but very close. So uh, if, ideally, you would have thought someone would have gotten a huge payday. The The top prize in this was only 200 bucks because nobody um, nobody got anywhere close to the perfect score. Mm. Uh, I don't think anybody... Uh, picked Matsuyama and if they did they didn't pick the right score uh, he finished 10 under I had 13 for the uh for the uh, championship so uh, it is what it is uh well it was looking like he was gonna have 13 no problem the way he had finished on Saturday coming into Sunday at 11 under it's like oh I know man he's gonna take that and roll with it but he didn't have a great Sunday he didn't yeah. have to because they didn't, neither did anybody else I hear you on that one all right, three three zero eight eight six zero eight one three. First, first Japanese man to win it. Yes, by the way. Yeah, and in a culture right now where uh, Asian Asians on, aren't exactly well liked, uh, the, apparently in this country, on the eve of the Olympics in Tokyo. Yeah, this is will be a part of. This is pretty cool. And by the so, way, if if you think about it, this guy's life is pretty much complete now because he can go back to Japan. Somebody told me he has at least a half a billion dollars worth of endorsements lined up, ready to go. Now that he's won the Masters, that's a that's crazy good. And then imagine how cool the opening ceremonies are going to be now when he walks out for for you know the, the his you know golf. Oh, trip. absolutely. He might carry the Japanese flag. Oh, I would I would hope so now. I mean, uh, hell, he might light the torch for, for the Tokyo Olympics. I mean, like Ali did in Atlanta. Uh, this guy is now uber popular in Japan now that he's won the Masters. I mean, he is uh, he's now the guy in, in the country of Japan. And, and like I said, uh, there was talk that he got at least a half a billion dollars worth of endorsements from the... Uh, from the companies in Japan, so this guy's life is made all because he not to played money, four good rounds of golf. Not to, not to mention the purse he gets for winning the Masters. Yeah, he got over two million dollars winning the Masters, uh, and he has to flip what ten percent to his caddy. So his caddy just made two hundred grand and change. So yeah, he's he's sitting pretty uh, right now. He could uh, not golf for the rest of his life and be. Well, I don't think he has to work the rest of he his can, life. He can do nothing. I mean, he, that, like I said, the endorsements alone, he doesn't have to work the rest of his life. Now he's half a billion dollars richer, and, and uh, yeah, that's... Well, what he, it, it takes the pressure off, man. Oh, no like, doubt. Like, you don't have to go to win anymore. I mean, you want to win, of course, because sure. you're a competitor. But you don't have to, you know, hey, if I, if I don't play well... I, don't care. Well, he's, I mean, look, he's got the he's he's got the green jacket, and he finally has a win in the major. So I, I think all of that pressure is off. Now, unfortunately, our guy, uh, he did well for one round, and when we spoke with Brian Tolnar, uh, he had said, "Look, the goal for Jason should be make the cut." He made, made the, the cut, cut, albeit barely. He made the cut. Um, but things got bad after that. He just doesn't know the course. But you have to expect it because things get harder on that course on Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, absolutely. And they, that was only his second time playing that right. course. And so, then, but he let a little bit of frustration get the better of him. Oh, no doubt. I mean, he threw one into the lake after right. he uh, double bogeyed. Uh, once, once that leaks into your head as a golfer, you're done. Yeah, exactly. Admittedly done. You're it it done. just it was uh, it, it was tough to watch, but. Better days are ahead for him. And, and I think Brian's 100% right on this. This is one of those courses where it's not like you can play it all the time uh, because it's not open all the time. That's why. Uh, you, you just have to be there year after year after year, get used to this course, know this course, 
and, and your score will improve. That's why DeChambeau sucked this weekend because he didn't know this course. He and Jason are playing Augusta for just the second time and for the first time in the springtime. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a different course in I'd, the spring than it is in the fall. I'd be interested to know. We'll ask Brian this on Wednesday. Maybe he knows. In the Masters history, what's the lowest number of rounds that you've played at ma- at the Masters for a winner? Like, no, I'm I'm betting no one's won it in their first attempt. I would think not. So it's like, what's the lowest number of, like, this is my you know third Masters or whatever? Does uh, a winner have? In Masters history for for a win for a green cap. Yeah, I would I would highly doubt that because um, he said usually you know it, you don't start to get really good at that course until your fifth or sixth time there. So I wonder if anyone's even won it their third time. Yeah, that's that's, uh, that's a great how, question. I wonder how many times Hideki Matsuyama has played at that because he's not that old. No, he isn't. So he couldn't have been there too too many times. No, no, he's he. Uh, I, I would imagine this was probably his third or fourth time. Because, again, in order to go to the Masters, you have to either finish in the top 20 uh, in FedEx points, or top 30, I'm sorry, top 30 in FedEx points, or you have had to have won a PGA event during the uh, year from the time the Masters ended to the week before the Masters began the next year. So or of course, you win a Masters, and you're, then you can... Then you can go them. anytime you want to. Right. Uh, you can play every year. You're invited back all the time. So Hideki Matsuyama could be 95 <laughs> years old, and if he wants to play in the Masters, <laughs> he's playing. by God, he's playing in the Masters because he's a former champion. Uh, speaking of former champions, the Mahoning Valley Scrappers are going to announce uh, very soon, they're, uh, like today... Their like, new like manager, in like ten minutes, uh, like uh, very very soon, yeah. uh, the, the the draft league, the MLB draft league, is going to be announcing the managers. As a matter of fact, uh, they just announced them, <laughs> and we can tell you right now who the Mahoning Valley Scrappers manager is. Uh, if you remember, uh, Jordan uh, Taylor uh, said, "Hey, uh, the guy that is going to be the manager of the." Of the Scrappers, he's a former Indian, and he is a big, not a big name, but a well-known name and in Indians lore. I might add that he is a well-known name in Kansas City Royals lore, too. Yeah. And he played, he's played for a lot of teams. He's the played, Oakland A's as well. A's, I think he did a stint in the Red Sox. Yes, he you're did. Start, I think you're starting to get who we, who we uh, get you, you, you might maybe. You might confuse him with a cereal. Uh, it is, I think that's the dead giveaway. Coco Crisp is your new manager for the Mahoning Valley Scrappers. By the way, if you go to the Draft League's Twitter, the picture they chose for him, perfect. You know, he's, he's doing one of these at the camera, and he's like front and center. Yeah. You know, he's the middle guy. Oh, perfect. Okay, here are your, uh, here are your managers. Coco Crisp will manage the Mahoning Valley Scrappers. Jed Yorko. Uh, is going to uh, manage the West Virginia Black Bears. Uh, Jeff Manto is going to manage the Trenton Thunder. Derek May is going to manage the Frederick Keys. Delwyn Young is going to manage the State College Spikes. And former professional player and veteran minor league coach Billy Horton. Uh, and, and we can just write a, write a novel about this. Billy Horton, here's a who. <laughs> Billy Horton will be uh, rounding out the group as he is managing the Williamsport Crosscutters. So there you go. Uh, Coco Crisp is the manager of the Mahoning Valley Scrappers. I wonder if we're going to have a uh, Coco Crisp bobblehead doll night. What's his coaching experience? I don't think he has any. I don't know what he did after. I don't don't think Coco has any. Uh, but I, I think the the whole thing with this is they wanted to get some former big leaguers involved in this uh, and just try to have the players understand, you know, this is a guy that was in the major leagues or, or in Williamsport's case, uh, this is a guy that has a lot of uh, coaching experience. Uh, you got You want to listen to this guy uh, because he's been to the dance before. Uh, by the way, the Major League Baseball Draft, 68 games, Major League Baseball Draft League, 
68 games, 34 home, 34 away. Opening day is May the 24th. The home opener for the Scrappers is May the 26th. The first 43 games will be played between opening day and July the 8th. The league will take off the 9th through the 14th for the MLB draft, which will now be held in Denver, Colorado. Uh, the um, hey, we were right. Draft is going to be uh, July 11th, 12th, and 13th. All right, we were right with the with the with the teams he's played for. He's played for the Indians from 2002 to 2005. Also, one year in 2016, he came back to. Uh, Cleveland played with the Red Sox from 2006 to 2008. Played with Kansas City for one year in 2009, and he had the longest stint with the with the with the A's from 2010 to 2016. Nice. Um, Chris led the American League. I mean, Chris, not Chris, uh, in stolen bases in 2011. So he knows how to. He'll probably be aggressive on the base pass. You would imagine. I would hope. As a, as a man. I would hope. All right, so the uh, the play is going to resume. The, uh, the the draft league will resume uh, after the break uh, from July 9th through the 14th, in which the MLB draft is going to be held the 11th through the 13th. Uh, 42 of the first 68 games will be played prior to the draft. The final 26 games will be played. Final regular season game will be played on August the 13th. The season will be over by August the 16th. Uh, as I'm going to assume, the top two teams will play a best of three series so, to determine the league champion. Just to answer my own question earlier, after retirement, 41 year old um, coach for his old high school, Shadow Hills High School in Indio, California, for two years. Uh, then he was on the Oakland Athletics broad- radio broadcast team as a game analysis in 2019, and he is currently serves as a bench coach for. Saratos College, which is in Norwalk, California. So he does have coaching experience. There you not, go. not at this level, but he's a bench coach in college now. He's coached high school for a couple of years, and he was also on the broadcast team for, for the A's. Outstanding. So. All right, so the season starts on Monday, May the 24th. That's a little over a month from now. Matter of fact, let's do some quick arithmetic. I believe that's six weeks from today. Uh, 1926. Two, nine. No, no. Uh-huh. no, it would be uh, seven weeks from today. I beg your pardon. Seven weeks from today, uh, the uh, scrappers will begin their. Um, no, six weeks from today. Uh, you'd get it right the first time, right? Six weeks from today, uh, the scrappers will begin the uh, Major League Baseball Draft League uh, in West Virginia. Two game series in West Virginia. And then the Scrappers return home. The home opener is going to be on Wednesday night, May the 26th at 7.05 p.m. against State College. All the home games are going to be heard right here on YSNlive.com. Yours truly will be doing the play-by-play. And uh, this is going to be fun. Uh, Every Sunday when we're home, uh, we'll have our little uh, weekly to-do with Coco. And uh, pre-game show, we'll have interviews with uh, various players this is going to be an absolute blast. Looking forward to doing this. Hey, Coach's Corner with Coco Crisp. That's a nice has a nice ring to it. Coco's Co- Coco's Coach's Corner. Yeah. yeah. Say that three times quick. Coco's Coach's Corner. Yeah. Co- yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 all right. You smart ass. Three three zero eight eight six zero eight one three. The MP Vivo Heating and Air Conditioning Hotline open for business. So there you go. Coco Crisp. Is uh, you know pour some milk on this guy yeah. on this season? It's going to be fun. He does have a ring, by the way. He yeah. won with Boston the uh, Red Sox. 2007 Boston Red Sox. Indeed, so. indeed, they did. Uh, he did uh, with the uh, with the Red Sox. So uh, Coco Crisp is your manager for the Mahoning Valley Scrappers, and congratulations to him. A couple of a uh, couple of things to to uh, clean up before we get into uh, softball and baseball. Uh, we, we have landing spots for a couple of former uh, YSU Penguins. Mary Dunn yep. uh, is going to head to Pitt, uh, where she will she, close out her uh, collegiate career. She's going to join YSN alum Dayton Ed Harris from Ursland. Yeah, and this should, uh, this should be fun to, to, uh, to see those two uh, do their thing on the basketball floor. And Neka Obeizer has found a home in Sin City, USA, 
as she will go to UNLV and be part of the running Rebels. And that's it's, not a bad landing spot for little, her as well. You know, it's, it's, it's still a mid-major, but it's a little bit more of a step up. They play a little bit more of a, you know, power five heavy non-conference schedule than maybe YSU does. Um, so she'll be up a little bit in competition, but still a mid-major. So that's a good spot for her. All the way over across the country. I, we, we didn't expect that. We thought she'd stay home in Dayton or something like that. But, I, see, I thought she was going to stay home and stay in Minnesota, Minnesota and, I mean. and, and, and be Sorry. with the Golden Gophers right. and be a Big Ten program because I think that she has the ability to be a uh, Power 5 player, but she chose to uh, go to another mid-major. I, I you know, I'm, now I'm a little more disappointed uh, that NECA uh, left because she just took a hey, – she didn't really take a step up. We, She's still in a mid-major. We, that's a heart that we don't know the reasons why she left or, or you know, what was going – I mean, it could have been a fit thing. It could have been like she just wasn't fitting. She didn't feel like herself was fitting into the program and she just felt like UNLV was a better fit. It couldn't. It, it might not have been just a I want to step up in competition or I think I can do better at a power five. It might have just been – I need a better fit. I, I need some, you know, it, it could have been something like that. So yeah, it's hard to speculate because no one is inside the mind of NECA, so no one knows why she left. Heck of a her, talent. Except her and the coaches that, that she probably talked to and her family. Yeah. So, um, you know, we wish her the best, and, and I, I think she's going to make a name for herself over in Las Vegas. Yeah, heck of a talent. And she has four years of eligibility uh, for UNLV, so it's going to be just like getting it, yeah. Okay. She's running rebel, uh, so it'll be four years of uh, of playing for the running rebels, and we'll see what happens there. So uh, good to see, did, uh, uh, good to see her find a home. I feel like did McKenna Peters say where she was going? I have yet? not, okay. I have not seen anything uh, regarding McKenna Peters. But Chelsea I Olson did say she was staying. Yes, which wasn't announced. Yes, so Chelsea Olson is staying at YSU. Yes. Uh, I have I have not seen where DQ is going, uh, Darius Quisenberry. I'm assuming that he's going to stay home and play with Dayton. Then again, we we uh, we might be wrong on that. Wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> certainly, certainly wouldn't be no, the first time, and you, it sure as hell won't be the you, last uh, time. You, the, the manager announcement was off your radar because oh, your, he your guesses weren't. Uh, you're weren't right, uh, and I and I even told um, when we had the conversation with Jordan. I, I said, oh, look, off the record, who is this? And then he explained to me, you can't say anything until the text comes out. But he said, Coco Crisp. And I was like, well, that's off my radar. <laughs> he goes, why? Who did you think? I said, well, Len Barker or Joe Charbonneau. But they both coach. And I think uh, Len Barker's the head coach over at Notre Dame College, the D2 program in northeastern Ohio up around Cleveland. Uh, so, yeah, it, it was Certainly off my radar, but a great choice. Right, uh, definitely a great choice. So uh, it was good to see Coco Crisp uh, uh, back in the fold as he will be managing the Mahoning Valley Scrappers uh, when we kick this season off. Six weeks from today, the Scrappers will be opening up the 2021 inaugural Major League Baseball Draft League as they take on the West Virginia Black Bears, who are going to be coached by Jeff Mantos. Former Indian, by the way. Right. So there you go. All right. Over the weekend, some uh, college. Er, college. Well, we did have some college baseball. We did have some college. We did have some college softball. We did. Hail to the Penguins. They're in first place. They took three out of four from Green Bay and and uh, first place Penguins. There you it's go. Got a nice ring to it. Uh, absolutely, it does. Uh, we had some high school baseball and high school softball over the weekend. Uh, some some pretty interesting games that were played. Yeah, I I was at the, uh, the the Poland triple header on Saturday where where Boardman kind of kind of showed out. You know, we were kind of wondering how Boardman was going to fare this year on the softball field, uh, but they came in, they beat a Gerard team that was pretty competitive in, in in five innings, and then they went into extras with Poland and and beat Poland uh, four to three. So, a uh, very impressive showing from the Spartans on that day. Um, you know, after walking off Hubbard on Thursday, they, they're really carrying momentum into this week, so they should have a good week for the Spartans. I know I saw Hubbard take both games of a doubleheader from West Branch, which is making me really open my eyes and say, you know, Hubbard's going to be a very good contender inside that NE8 for softball. Uh, you know, you can't sleep on them because they, they haven't been there in the past, but... Now it might be a three-horse race between Hubbard, Poland, and South Range. We're going to find out a lot because South Range and, and Poland are scheduled to play 
today. We don't know. I mean, rain is a, a high possibility. But as of now, scheduled to play today and tomorrow, uh, South Range in Poland. So we'll see how that goes. Let's not forget about Lakeview either. Lakeview, Lakeview girls are, are, are not bad. Yeah. They're not I, bad. I want to see that that marquee win, like, like the Hubbard against West Branch, that really says, okay, they can play at this high level and, and they're winning games – uh, but but Lakeview's off to a great start. Maggie Pavlansky uh, individually for the Bulldogs, a really great start for, for Lakeview. Okay, now, uh, when people are taking stats, uh, I, I kind of look at the statistics in baseball with a, with a side glance because sometimes uh, people give hits where they should be errors and, and whatnot. But there is an interesting statistic. Whether this is uh, completely accurate or not, irregardless, this is an amazing statistic. There are six kids right now in the Hubbard softball team that are hitting over 600. Right. That is ridiculous. And they went up against a really good pitcher on Saturday, by the way. If you, I mean... Uh, so the, it's not like they've been throwing; they've been going up against you know scrubs in the pitcher circle. West Branch has a good pitching staff, and they 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 hit her pretty well too. So um, yeah, their 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 offense looks mighty impressive, especially not the power that you see from South Range in Poland, but the averages. I mean the one the lineup there's no there's not a break in it. Um, so th- that's one of the more impressive things, and they can pitch pretty well. Yeah. Um, they can pitch pretty and well. they've loaded their schedule up. They played Maslin Perry earlier in the year. Oh, they yeah. played Boardman. They've played West Branch. They're going to be playing in this really tough NE8. Uh, they've loaded their schedule up pretty good. This is this, this, yeah. I'm with you, uh, partner. I think Hubbard might be a team that you better you better look at instead of just fi- uh, fixating on the the two powerhouses in the NE8, and and rightfully so because Poland and South Range are both really good softball teams. Yeah, and one of the things that really, for Poland, what looked good is in the Boardman game, they couldn't throw Katie McDonald again. They just couldn't do it. I mean, she had thrown every inning for them so far this year, and with South Range coming up on Monday, Tuesday, they just couldn't throw her twice in one day. Uh, Coach Surich just had to find someone else to start in the circle. They threw Cam Latanzio. She threw four innings pitch, only gave up two hits. Two runs scored, but none of them were earned. She did a pretty good job in the circle against a, a really quality Boardman team, and that, that was the first time she pitched. I think she said to me after the games, and she was 12 years old. So pretty impressive to, to go into the circle and just do what you're do what you're supposed to. No strikeout. She pitched a contact and trusted her defense behind her, and, and that did a good enough job to, to get the Poland into extra innings. Unfortunately, you know they lost four to three, but very commendable job from Latanzio in the circle to kind of give Katie McDonald a little, little bit of a break. You know, and I'm so glad that uh, there are kids that pitch to contact. That's not a bad thing. Yeah, when you know you don't have strikeout stuff and you just you just have to do your job, hit your spots, and, and pitch to contact. Uh, the velocity's not there, but that's okay. If, if, you're hitting, if you're hitting your spots, the velocity doesn't have to be there. Uh, and Latanzio hit most of her spots. Yeah, exactly, and 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 I think that that people are so fixated on strikeouts, and okay, I mean it's a power. And strikeout is the pitcher's equivalent of home runs for the everyday player. You you and we all want to see someone just go out and strike everyone out. Okay, I I get We've that, seen, but pitching to contact is not a that. bad thing, especially if you can locate your pitches where you know this person's not getting a home run off of this particular pitch. If I throw a ball knee-high in her half of the plate, this ball won't leave the yard. There's no possible way anyone can hit a home run from knee-high inside corner unless you know that that is coming and, and you guess that location. And usually the strikeout pitchers are the ones that are more prone to give home runs away because they're the ones that you know focus on velocity and focus on just throwing it by people. And if someone times up that velocity... You know, that, that can leave the ballpark in, in, a, in a long, long time. You know, in a quick time, I should say. So usually the strikeout pitchers are, are, the, are the ones that are more prone to give up the long ball. No, absolutely. If you hang them, they'll bang them. <laughs> right. Uh, so, you know, and, and uh, if you're pitching to contact, kids that pitch to contact, they don't give up home runs. Mm-hmm. Now, they may give up a string of hits, but they won't give up many home runs by pitching to contact because they know, okay, 
This area right here, it's a no-no. I can't put any pitch here because it'll get destroyed because I don't have the velocity some of the other pitchers do. And both teams, two pitchers on Saturday, looked, looked really good for them. I mean, Boardman had Catahoro thrown in the circle against Gerard. They run ruled them. She didn't allow a single run. And then, and then Poland, like I said, put through their number two, uh, Cam Latanzio, in, the, in their game against Boardman and held a good Boardman lineup to two runs scored, and neither one of them was earned. So... Um, impressive. Uh, by the way, speaking of Cat O'Horo, uh, other than the one crooked inning scored by Poland in the fourth, she was dominant. Right. Uh, now, that crooked score or crooked number that uh, Poland put up was a three spot. Uh, they scored a run in the bottom of the seventh inning to put the ball game into extra innings. Boardman scored a run in the top of the eighth, and then uh, there you go. Right. And, and it was one of those things where to come up in, in that bottom of the eighth inning, it was. Mary Brandt and Katie McDonald one and two in that lineup, well one and two in that inning, and Mary Brandt had six home runs coming into that at bat, and Katie McDonald had five, and she struck out Brandt I believe, and uh, got McDonald to ground out. So I mean to get those two outs off the bat when your team takes the lead in the eighth inning, um, big big outs for for Ohoro and, and to to come in relief because Luster started that game. Yeah, absolutely. It was just a it was solid win for Boardman. Uh, over the weekend, picking up a victory over Poland. And, you know, as we mentioned earlier in the week, Boardman finally played a home game uh, against Hubbard, and, and they were able to get the victory there. So Boardman is starting to uh, is starting to crank it up a little bit, and as I'm, we knew they would. I'm eyeing a little bit later in the week. They play at home against Champion on Friday. Ooh. That'll be fun. It's a great, a great matchup for both teams. Uh, the Columbiana girls continue to roll. Uh, they they beat they beat Salem uh, over the weekend. Mackenzie Gamble, maybe freshman of the year so far in my eyes, with the way she's pitching for for Columbiana so far. We came into this season knowing Tori Long would be really good for them in the circle, and she has been, and and she'd be a pitcher that can rake, hit the long ball when she has to. No pun intended. Uh, but I don't think I didn't. You're pretty good with the puns this you know, week. You've been uh, you've been cranking you know, them out. You started with a couple today, so I had to bring one to the oh, table. Well, that's true. Yeah, so, that is true. By the way, Gamble um, and Long did go yard in that um, victory for Columbia. There you go. Um, but um, Gamble coming in as a freshman, that was an unknown. You didn't really know what she was going to bring, and she's brought a lot to the circle. Now all of a sudden, Columbia has two pitchers that can throw at you that are both really tough to hit. Gamble throws gas. I mean, the velo- I got to watch her on Friday against McDonald. They lost that game 2 nothing, but she throws this absolute velocity, um, and, and it's one of the fastest freshman pitchers I've seen in a long time. Um, this, this gas. Just- she has a nuclelouche quality about her because uh, the line against Salem was 12 strikeouts and five walks. Right. Very nuclelouche type of uh, type <laughs> hey, of numbers. Sometimes it can be effectively wild. Absolutely. It works. I, uh, and I like that. I mean, it, okay, you get some kids on, you got to pitch in and out of trouble, uh, especially if you get multiple players on base in softball, you got to pitch in and out of trouble. And if you've got a cannon for an arm, you you can get yourself out of trouble by striking out someone and, and, yeah. and just and basically putting an end to an uprising. Brie Callow for McDonald continues to impress. I mean, she had another multi-strikeout game on Saturday against Middle Ridge in the second game of that series. Um, she has 98 strikeouts on the year so far in, in about 42 and a third innings pitch. Um, so she's two away from 100, and we're only two and a half weeks into the season. Yikes. Um, That's just, effectively yeah. two punch-outs an inning. And a lot of her games have been five-inning you know, wins. So she's not even getting a full seven innings for most of these games. Yikes. Uh, just impressive. Impressive. Crestview got a victory over United. That's a non-conference game. Uh, Sutton wound up with 13 punch-outs and, um, and one walk. That's a strong bounce back because Crestview had a really disappointing loss to Gerard on Thursday where Gerard kind of came back on him. Scored a run in the top of the seventh to take a late lead, and uh, then Crestview couldn't come back. And so that's a big win uh, for Crestview to kind of bounce back from that disappointing loss at home. 
uh, to, to beat United. Well, they're they're going to have to be at the top of their game because a team in their league just happens to be pretty exactly. pretty good. Uh, that's uh, th- those but games are going to be uh, they're going to be an absolute test. I'll say that, that you know everyone came into this season just like just like Columbia. Everyone came into this season knowing Tory Long was going to be good in the circle. Everyone came into this season knowing Kane Sutton was going to bring something special to the circle for Crestview. What people didn't see, come at least me is McKenna Schultz coming into the circle and, and being a really good number two for them. Not only is she a um, good pitcher, she's a really, a really good, good hitter. athlete. Ho, ho, ho. And, and a strong athlete in the field when she's not in the circle. Yeah. A uh, middle infielder when she's not pitching. Uh, just uh, maybe one of the better athletes on the team, just for her athletic prowess. Um, so, yeah, uh, they have two pitchers that can really give you trouble, and that that's some of the, one of the things that are going to make them better than most, most teams. Now, yeah. whether or not they're going to be – Good enough to be a champion. We'll have to wait and see. Because champion, I would say if Crestview found them early, you know, because champion is still trying to figure some stuff out uh, against a really tough schedule. They lost to Indian Valley over on Thursday to another late run in the seventh inning that knocked them off. But then they went and they beat, uh, I want to say, Shadyside on the weekend. They're just playing these teams that are like, wow, wow. Yeah. You're (laughs) playing. You know, and, and once again, we'll see what champions made of this week because after their two league games on Monday and Tuesday, they're going to play Ursuline on Thursday and Boardman on Friday. So they're really the loading the schedule. They're loading the schedule, and there's nothing wrong with that. And, and you know, you don't expect anything else from Cheryl Weaver. No, absolutely not. Uh, baseball wise, it was good to see Crest. Or I'm sorry, uh, uh, Springfield. Uh, they suffered a loss earlier in the week. They bounced back. They beat Minerva, non-conference affair. Uh, the uh, Tigers now 5-1 and one on the campaign. Niles got a five-inning victory uh, over Camel, 12-1. to one. Newton Falls non-conference win over Matthews. Uh, West Branch, there's that team again. They're now 7-2 and two on the campaign. And uh, what they, they, they obliterated Hubbard. What they did to Hubbard over the weekend, uh, that, that's cause for concern. Because uh, Hubbard's a good team. Hubbard went down to Tennessee and competed with some uh, reigning state champions down in Tennessee. So Hubbard's on a slump. So to do what they did to Hubbard on Saturday, uh, very impressive. Now Hubbard's 2-8, and eight, but again, they've yeah. played a really, really, I mean, really good schedule with the trip. Four of those eight uh, losses, like I said, are to Tennessee, and, and a lot of those teams were either state champions or state contenders in, yes. in, that, in that field. So. Yes. And they lost by one run to, in three of those four games. Yep. Yeah, it's a, it's a much much better team than one uh, than one would think. Uh, Crestview hammered United. Uh, Tyler Millhorn getting the uh, getting the victory. Sam Campbell has um, has impressed me. He had three more hits uh, in this game on Saturday, and he uh, and I believe this is the first time uh, or the first year for him to pitch. He's really become a real nice pitcher. Uh, for Crestview as well. You know, and we talked we talked so much about champion softball. Their baseball team is off to a really good, impressive start as well. Yeah. Their baseball team looks really good. Uh, they got a win over the weekend. Um, so um, they, they, they look strong. Champion, both sides look strong. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, look, the champion boys, what was it, about three or four was, years ago. It was, uh, so it was Champion won three in a row. It was their second, I believe. So I think it was in 2000... 2017? 2018? They won both both ones? Yeah. It, it was... 17. It, it was... Uh, it, it was the year... The year after South Range won theirs. So South Range won theirs what year? Uh, 18? 17. 17. Then, then Champion won theirs in 2018. Uh, and that was when uh, you get, you couldn't go from one to the other because champion softball was playing in Akron, and the baseball was playing down in, yeah, exactly. in Columbus. Exactly. We wound up uh, when I was still working in in radio. We wound up broadcasting the Salem. Or not the Salem. We wound up broadcasting the uh, the softball championship from Probably Akron. Probably because it was closer. You know? uh, well, and that and the fact that um, they were going for their second in a row. Everyone wanted to. Uh, everyone wanted to. Go in and buy in on the uh, on the champion train. Uh, so the the advertising spoke uh, volumes with that one, as do uh, all broadcast. Uh, the the uh, the advertisers speak where we go in, in in radio, but this is different because we have everyone. Uh, so you jump on board uh, with the advertising because uh, we do your games. 
uh, or at least we're doing a lot of teams games. So, right, right. Uh, you know, that's that's the beautiful part of YSN for sure. All right, three three zero eight eight six zero eight one three on the schedule today. We will hear from Dana Bolish, TV twenty one sports director. We'll get his take on the announcement made by the Major League Baseball Draft League. Again, in case you're tuning in, Coco Crisp is the new manager of the Mahoning Valley Scrappers. Uh, I think it's a great decision uh, for the MLB Draft League to get Coco Crisp over here, former Indian, uh, and given the fact that the Scrappers were a Indian's uh, farmhand uh, from the beginning of the of the uh, storied franchise, this is a good move. I believe Coco even played uh, for the Scrappers way back when. I believe he did. Well, I mean, it would make sense. I mean, he started his career with the Indians, so. Uh, I want to say that he did play for the Scrappers, but, I, you know, again, could be wrong. Uh, we do, will, we'll have to do some digging. We will hear from Dana Bolish at 1 o'clock. Bob Hannon, the voice of the YSU football penguins, uh, will be calling in at 2 o'clock. Uh, YSU, uh, they were good defensively, uh, the spotty uh, in, at times, but unfortunately... Uh, they they had a um, they had a hiccup on uh, on offense. Uh, the biggest of the biggest reason why was because of the fact that uh, uh, Mark Wade was not playing. Wade was out with an upper body injury, uh, and they turned to their backup quarterback Joe Craycraft, and uh, his receivers didn't exactly uh, give him. A lot of confidence, uh, but he also threw some passes that were not good, uh, and ultimately the uh, Penguins wound up losing to uh, Missouri State twenty-one to ten. And you have to add all of that into consideration with they're playing a Missouri State team that is playing for their playoff lives. Yes. Uh, so you you, uh, you combine all of that, it doesn't equal anything good for for Youngstown State. Yeah. Now the poor people in Missouri State. Um, I, I really feel for that was the, their last game of the season, yeah. right? And, and I really feel for the person who came up with this idea because uh, it's going to be embarrassing. Uh, somebody over there thought that this was the last week of the Missouri Valley Football Conference Ooh, season, uh-oh. and they made oh no Missouri Valley Football Conference championship shirts. Oh no, and. Well, that's not necessarily the did. case because North Dakota State won over yeah. the weekend. They beat Northern Iowa, and they're tied with Missouri State. Now, unfortunately, North Dakota State plays this Saturday against South Dakota State. The Missouri State needs them to lose because that's their one loss in conference play. Exactly. So Missouri State does not have a game left. They 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 could or they didn't play North Dakota, but they didn't play North Dakota uh, last weekend or, or a couple of weekends ago. Uh, they, the, In other words, um, their game against North Dakota was not going to be made up Unlike our game against North Dakota, which because, is made because up because of that, because of that, they're, yeah, because they're making up the game with YSU, they had no room to make it up with Missouri. State. Exactly. And, and if I was the Missouri Valley Conference, I'd be like, mm, North Dakota, why don't we just say, uh, you know, we're going to move you to to play Missouri State instead of Young South State because, you know, the, the, that that's more of a playoff game. Well, and I the, would just be like, boop, boop. And, and, and the other part of this, I don't know if they can do that. Yeah. And that would be bad for Youngstown State. Yeah, absolutely it would be. So, but, but as an objective person, uh, for the Missouri Valley conference, I'd be like, the other, <laughs> the other part of this is, um, so they what, can't play Illinois state cause they're bounced I'm and they can't play Western Illinois cause they chickened out of the league as well. Oh, Western Illinois stopped. Oh, as soon as they beat Youngstown State, they were like, for the betterment of our kids, oh. we want to leave now. Bullshit. Go out on you top. beat YSU, <laughs> and now you're saying, peace out, we're out of here. That's what the reason why you did it. You, only, the- you won the game that you, the only game that you could win, you won, and you said, peace out. Don't they hand me this. Yeah, don't hand me this crap. For the betterment of our kids, get the hell out of here. You won the one game that you had to win or that you could only win, oh. and there you go. Uh, so they're out. So Missouri State is they are without a 
they're without a team, so they're not going to play this week. Mm. Well, if North Dakota State beats South Dakota State, Missouri State's not the conference champion. North Dakota State is because mm. they will finish seven and so or six and they, one, and Missouri State is five and one. And what's North Dakota State right now? Five and one. Five and one. So, so you, South Dakota State has to beat North Dakota State. And otherwise, if they don't. Otherwise, whoever the poor schlub was that made these T-shirts right. uh, is, is going to get an F- in arithmetic. And if they don't, if North Dakota State wins, then Missouri State has to hope and pray to the football god, small G, that Youngstown State beats North Dakota. Oh, absolutely. Because that's their only other role into the playoffs is yeah. if they Agreed. can get into North Dakota State. And, and, I say, and, and that's a good call on your part because Missouri State beat South Dakota State. Right. So if there is the, okay, we got to get a second team involved here, who do we put in? Um, you may want to uh, look at Missouri State instead of South Dakota State because, well, both these teams have two losses, but Missouri State beat them in the regular season. North Dakota State has two losses. They just lost to a one-win YSU team. Uh, so that would be an ugly look for them. So for Missouri State to win the conference, not only does South Dakota State have to win, but I imagine that also means the Youngstown State has to win too. Because, well, because if South Dakota wins, then all of a sudden North Dakota would be 6-1 and one if they beat Youngstown well, State. Well, North Dakota didn't play. Uh, that, those, that, they were canceled. Uh, the only yeah, but they'd be six and one compared to five. No, they and one. would be five and one. They're right five now. and one right now. They're right? four and one right oh, okay. now. Okay. Yeah. So, so Youngstown State's their five and one game. Exactly. So then it would go to head to head. I imagine uh, well, not head to head with each other, but head to head in the. And Missouri State did lose to North opponent, Dakota. Common opponents. Well, Missouri State did lose to North Dakota this year. North Dakota year. State. Not oh, North that's Dakota. that's true. They didn't play North Dakota. You right. are correct on that. So it would go to common opponents, maybe. Uh, I guess and it would go to the committee and say, "Do well, we want to?" Do we want a five and one team or a five and four team in the playoffs? Who would win the conference though? If North it was Dakota tied? State. No, no, no. If if South Dakota State won, North Dakota oh, State's oh, out of it, and then North Dakota won, so it would be between North Dakota and Missouri State. They would be They're both five and one. They'd be co champs. They'd be co champs. There's yep. no tiebreaker. There, there would be no tiebreaker. That's they, they silly. Would be no, there should, there should be some kind well, of tiebreaker. You, you know that there's not. Uh, it, it would be it even would be if a, it's even if it's unfortunate enough for Missouri State to just be overall record, then North Dakota State would win because they have a better win percentage. Yeah, I can't imagine that Missouri State's going to be a playoff team anyway. Because well, they they are if South Dakota State wins, because then you say, hey, five and one in the league. We're not. I, I I refuse to hold the games that they played in the fall against them. I, I don't know if I the committee's going to, especially or not. when one of those games is against Oklahoma. Well, that's true, and and just, the other two are against Arkansas State or uh, Central which is Arkansas a solid team. or whoever the hell the Arkansas team was. It wasn't the Razorbacks; it was one of the other Arkansas. Arkansas. I think Arkansas, it was Central think. Arkansas, and they played them twice. So um, it's just like, uh, uh, look, I, uh, Bob Hannon uh, made this point, and I agree with him. Bobby Petrino, say what you want, and look, he's only at Missouri State because he's got a bad reputation. Uh, throughout Division One and the National Football League, uh, and he's got a lot of fences to mend. So he's trying to rebuild his his um, reputation as a college football coach. I gotta tell you what, as far as I'm concerned, he's the coach of the year in this conference. Absolutely, and when you're when you're picked to finish last, and you come into this weekend with a chance to win the conference, then then that's coach of the year in my opinion. Absolutely. I, I agree with you. Well, Missouri State knocked off the Penguins uh, 21-10. to 10. We made mention YSU. Uh, the softball team is in first place uh, after a doubleheader sweep of Green Bay. They're one game better than Oakland and Green Bay, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the YSU baseball team, uh, split. they split with Milwaukee. And, and nothing's disappointing in the grand scheme of things, because you always want to split on the road and dominate at home, that gets you a that gets you into postseason. But when you win the first two games of the series, I kind of wanted to see YSU take three out of four and say, "Okay, we're leaving Milwaukee, the second best team in this conference." Uh, and, it, and credit Milwaukee, hats off you you uh, you got the bats out and. 
and, especially that and last swept game. Uh, and, and took the, the the final two games. That last game uh, for Milwaukee was was pretty impressive. I mean, uh, YSU had a lead, you know, and then all of a sudden Milwaukee ties it at eight. They go into extra innings. You got the walk off granny, walk off grand slam. So yeah, um, you know, hey, to bounce back from losing the first two and and split with a good YSU team. Like you said, tip the hat to Milwaukee and move on to the next weekend. Yeah, and so they're in third place, one game out of Milwaukee, uh, where we started uh, before the weekend began. Uh, they're they're back where they started. Uh, you know, again, I, I would have liked to have seen the, uh, the the Penguins take three out of four. Would have been nice to have them at twelve and eight, and Milwaukee at eleven and nine. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, there is a dogfight for um, uh, third, fourth, and fifth place right now. Uh, Northern Kentucky and UIC are both 9 and 10. Uh, Purdue, Fort Wayne, and Oakland have not played, uh, and uh, Purdue, Fort Wayne didn't play over the weekend because Wright State now has a COVID situation. Uh, so they're they're done for two weeks. So their four-game series with the Mastodons wasn't played. Their four-game series with Oakland this week uh, will not be played. Oakland uh, went non-conference. Uh, they're three and thirteen. They they're going to have to do an awful lot of work to try to get in uh, to the top four. So Youngstown State says adios to Milwaukee and onward and upward for the Penguins. Uh, Penguins will travel uh, this week. They are headed to Northern Kentucky. This is a huge four gamer against the Norse uh, from Highland Heights, Kentucky. We talked about it last week. More important than trying to chase the top is keeping the people below you below you. So you could argue that this series goes North Dakota, North, see I'm in football mode, Northern Kentucky uh, is a little bit more important than that Wright State series. As much as it was a big morale boost to beat Wright State three out of four at, at home, um, as far as the standings go and as far as getting into the postseason go, this this series might be more important than that one because this one is the one that keeps the people below you below you. And, and they're actually ten do. and ten. Northern Kentucky is uh, is ten and ten, not uh, nine and ten. The uh, Horizon League has not kept up with their uh, standings. Uh, so Northern Kentucky is only one game in back of Youngstown State for third place. And UIC, uh, I'm going to take a look here real quick. I believe UIC is nine and eleven. Yeah, they're nine and eleven. And YSU took three out of four from them, right? Yes. So. Yeah. So uh, in Northern Kentucky's in fourth place at ten and ten. North uh, UIC is in fifth place at nine and eleven. Who, who's so, UIC playing this? Uh, week? UIC is playing, I believe, Milwaukee. Let me look here real quick. Uh, they are playing. Um, the, the Mastodons, I beg your pardon. They're playing okay. the Mastodons, oh. and then they and then they play uh, if, Milwaukee. If you can win this Northern Kentucky series, and the Mastodons maybe let's say split with UIC, that's big because that'll put that'll put distance from YSU from both those teams. Yeah. Um, so th- th- that's the goal, of course. Yeah. This, this is this is a huge series uh, with Northern Kentucky. Make no bones about that. And then they're back home to play Oakland. Uh, and then they go to Chicago to play UIC. So, um, so they play UIC twice this year. Yeah, I, I. Uh, that this that makes this series even more important because imagine you win the the in Northern Kentucky series, and then you go into a series with it, it's a sweepable series. I don't want to disrespect the Oakland. Everyone deserves their respect, especially in baseball. But it's a series where you can go in with the goal to sweep. Against the three and absolutely. Oakland Grizzlies. Yeah, absolutely. At least take three out of four, but so, your, your goal is to sweep that series. Right. So you can win seven out of the next eight, and, and that would be huge to try to solidify that three or, or even get into the two. No, no question. And, and again, trying to stay in the top four, that is the goal for this program because the top four teams in this league will go to the postseason. Uh, so uh, this is a huge series. Make no mistake about that. Uh, after splitting with Milwaukee, Penguins are just one game ahead of Northern Kentucky, and they get the Norse uh, this weekend. And we'll chat with the uh, the manager of the YSU baseball team 
uh, you know, Dan Bertolini tomorrow, and we'll uh, we'll talk about this because the the road gets pretty interesting uh, this week for sure. Uh, but the YSU softball team, uh, man, uh, this is this is a fun year. Uh, it, pitchers, first place, and and they're doing really well. Their pitchers continue to shine. Uh, you know, they're, they're pitching so well. Uh, their hitting is uh, decent. It's it's enough. You know, three three nothing, two to one. Those are two pitchers duels that you're able to win on Senior Day, by the way, on Saturday. Uh, they, they looked very impressive. Very impressive. You know, the last time the YSU baseball and softball team each had winning records. You got to go back about sixteen or seventeen years, and you know they're pretty close to doing that this year. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is this is a good time. It's a good time to be a baseball fan or a softball we fan. Knew that at coming in. We State. came into this season knowing both these teams had legitimate chances of winning the Horizon League. No, absolutely. So. This this is uh, this has been a fun year uh, in the springtime for uh, for YSU athletics. It's. And, uh, it's been a good year. Especially in the softball team because we have a couple of YSN alums that are, are doing pretty well on that softball team themselves. So yeah. when you see local talent uh, succeed at a high rate, uh, that's always good for, for local morale. And, and it's good for Brian Campbell to be proven that lo- local talent can succeed at the Division One level. So he's going to keep recruiting in the area. And, and same for the baseball team. When they, when they see local talent succeed, then that tells them that they can keep recruiting in this level at this area because this area provides division one level talent and and it's really nice to keep as many of those local athletes to stay home and and uh, go play college for a division one school and you know with this this conversation has been talked about long and long and, and longer uh, but it, it's not sometimes it, it's either not a good fit or the player from around here says, you know, I want to go away from this area and I want to spend my four years or however long it takes to get my uh, college degree. I want to go away from this area and see what life is like outside of the bubble that is the Mahoning Valley. There's right. nothing wrong with that. And, and if you want to go far enough where you get the college experience, but not so far that you're you know, you can't get home in an emergency kind of situation easily. And there are a, a couple of Horizon League teams that are perfect for you to land on. Sure. Unfortunately for YSU, you yeah. know, you hate to lose local talent, but you really hate to lose it inside the conference. But you can really lose it to Wright State because they're close enough. They're in that range. Uh, Robert, Morris, Robert Morris is Cleveland in that range. State. Cleveland State's in that range. So uh, it's it's not it's not exactly easy to recruit. Uh, in Northern that, in Kentucky's area. in that range. Right. You know, Northern Kentucky's only an extra – hour from Dayton yeah. so yeah. if and, you can go to Wright State there's no reason why you can't go to Northern Kentucky. absolutely and, and you know I mean again I mean it would suck that these kids would stay in the Horizon League and play against Youngstown State once or twice a year but you know if you wanted the full college experience there you go all right Dana Ballish will be coming up next we'll uh, chat with Dana Lots of things to uh, talk about. Again, uh, the Mahoning Valley Scrappers have a manager. He is a former Indian. He's a former Royal. Uh, he's a former uh, Red Sox. Former Red Sox. He's a former Athletic, and he loves Coco Crisp. And he's a World Series champion. Indeed, he is. Uh, and he's a cereal guy. And he's Coco Crisp Stop is it. your uh, is your uh, manager. You're beating the heck out of that joke. Yeah, well, I know, but I mean, it, it's just it's the you're gonna, truth. You're going to run out before the season even starts. Uh, well, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> going to say it to his face. Save I mean, yourself. Yeah, I'm not going to say that. Yourself. I'm not going to say that to his face. Save I'm just it. saying. <laughs> All right, Dan Abolish is coming up next. Uh, we will talk in a bit with the dean of sports directors, television wise, in this market. Stick around. New things happen all day. Some are good some not so good. In today's complicated world, while you're busy working, playing, and living life, we're busy helping you make sense of the day's news. And there's only one place where it comes together with clarity, context, and accountability. It's 21 News at 6 with me, Madison Tromler, and Derek Steyer. 21 News at 6. It's what the day's news really means to you. Welcome home to a home made homier with Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods. Inspiration starts at BairdBrothers.com and is turned into reality when high quality hardwoods are delivered right to your home. 
Baird Brothers has the latest design trends. Shiplap and skinny lap interior siding, antique oak rustic flooring, and, well, you'll find them all at BairdBrothers.com. Ordered easily, delivered conveniently, enjoyed comfortably. BairdBrothers.com. WRS Wealth Advisors, the area's premier wealth and retirement specialists. Located on South Avenue in Boardman. Hi, this is Jim Myers with Myers Family Insurance, your local Medicare and retirement resource. We're excited to have sports back. Whether you're on the field or cheering from the stands, sports unifies communities and brings hope for the future. We're all one team working together. At Myers Family Insurance, we know the importance of a great team. Our team continues to grow to help you with your Medicare and retirement needs. The annual election period is October 15th through December 7th. Now's the time to make sure your plan continues to meet your needs for the upcoming year. Call today. Hi, I'm Colin Chupa. And I'm Kelsey Clem from K-Squared Marketing. Our boutique marketing firm specializes in media planning and buying, public relations, event marketing strategies, and strategic sponsorships. We can integrate our services with your existing game plan, or we can be your entire marketing team. Your goals, our game plan. Let's, Let's win, win together. together. Call K-Squared Marketing at 330-623-2730 or visit ksquared.marketing to learn more. Chevrolet. Hubbard can help you get the financing you need regardless of your situation. I'm Tony Pache and I've helped thousands of customers in Northeast Ohio and Western Pennsylvania buy a vehicle. Bad credit, no credit, no problem. I can get you approved for a low interest loan and maybe even a low payment lease on a new car at the number one Chevy dealership in Trumbull County for three years in a row. Visit HubbardChevy.com to get pre-approved or come see me, Tony Pache, to get a new vehicle today. Remember folks, Hubbard can help. Welcome back to a Monday edition of Running Point presented by Greenwood Chevrolet on Mahoning Avenue in Austintown. Ron Potesta with you alongside Anthony Hardwig, and we are joined as uh, as we are every Monday at this time by TV21 Sports Director Dana Bollish. Dana, how are you today? Uh, doing well, Ron. I, sometimes I feel like a stale leftover marshmallow peat. Uh, do, do tell. <laughs> do tell. I, you know, it's just a dreary Monday, and, uh, you know, just kind of one of those days. Well, listen, I mean, uh, you're, you, uh, if you feel like a marshmallow, you can think about possibly being a part of a, of a s'more, and maybe that will make you feel better. A very well could be the case. <laughs> hey, uh, Coco Crisp, the new manager for the Mahoning Valley Scrappers, as we get into the 2021 inaugural Major League Baseball Draft League. And, you know, I was told by uh, Jordan Taylor, the general manager, prior to this announcement that uh, it would be a name known by Indians fans. Mission accomplished. Yeah, you know, and I, I have to give credit for this uh, Major League Draft League run. I mean, they got some pretty well-known names. Jed Giorgio, uh, Jeff Manto, a former, uh, former Indian, Derek May, Delwyn Young, Billy Horton. So those are some names from the past, uh, you know, but uh, certainly uh, Coco Crisp is one of those as well. And uh, I'm pleasantly surprised uh, of, of the list of managers, you know, who, who I've seen. When you look at the, the hiring of Coco Crisp and, the, and all these names that you just said, do, do you think that gives a, a little bit of um, legitimacy to this draft league that, that maybe MLB really wanted to, to see some legitimacy in some players that have really succeeded in their career and have had really strong careers um, in the MLB to come and, and, and coach these teams? Well, I, I think, first of all, you got to look at it this way. All these teams were affiliated with major league teams, and they are no longer affiliated with, with major league teams. You know, the, the Scrappers and the Indians were together for 21 years or 20 years. And I think, you know, to, to kind of get that back, you know, so fans feel, you know, they're part of major league baseball, uh, you know, you had, to, you had to get some names that people were familiar with. And certainly... I, I think they did a good job with the scrappers in, in getting Coco Crisp. I mean, he's going to come from the West Coast. Um, you know, now whether people are going to come out and, and uh, you know watch games, uh, I, I think that's still yet to be determined. Um, you know, I, I think 
you know, at this level, you know, I think it's entertainment values, and I'm sure the scrappers will do a great job with the entertainment value. But, um, you know, I think being an Indians affiliate, as the scrappers were for the last 20 years, I think that played a huge part in people going out there. Now, will that continue? I, I think that's still to be determined. Um, but I, I think this is a step in the right direction. I think it's going to be a better brand of baseball in that most, if not all, of these kids that are going to be taking part in this league are going to be drafted. Uh, they're just all trying to trying to get themselves a higher draft pick so they can get a higher bonus and they can get paid more money uh, in terms of bonus uh, as concerned. But um, I, I think there's a really good chance this becomes a better league talent-wise up and down the rosters. Okay, and, and again, I'm not the smartest bulb in the package, and, and I, I'm not going to doubt that, but I, I guess my question is, you know, when this league opens six weeks today, which is, um, you know, May 24th, these guys are going to play, and, and, and I believe the draft is the week of uh, July 12th. So, so what happens in the final four weeks of the season if these players are drafted? Do they stay with this team? Do they go to their team they're supposed to? You know, that, I, I think there's some... You know, and again, I think that's some questions that we're just not sure. Um, you know, what happens to these players, um, you know, if they are drafted? Uh, do they leave immediately? Do they not leave? Uh, and again, I, I think, you know, there's we need, and again, as this get, draws closer, I'm sure we'll get clarity on that. No, I agree with you, Dan. And, and I think that uh, I would hope that the draft league and those in Major League Baseball are going to suggest uh, you can't order the 30 franchises to do this, but I would hope that they would suggest that the 30 franchises who draft these players would just as soon leave the players in this draft league, let them get their feet wet, uh, finish the season out, and then in 2022, everyone would begin their professional career probably in low A ball or high A ball if they uh, dominate in the spring training of 2021. Uh, but I'm with you. I, I, think, I think this is going to be very interesting once the draft is complete and these kids ultimately sign with their team. All right, where do they go? Do they stay in the draft league for the rest of the year? Uh, does the Major League Baseball team that drafted them say, okay, we've signed you, get out of this league, and let's uh, let's get you to your your first home on your stop to Major League Baseball? I don't know how this is going to work. I, and I hope Manfred and the geniuses, and I use air quotes when I say that, uh, in New York are going to strongly suggest to the 30 franchises Hey, when you sign this, when these kids keep them in the draft league through the end of the year, when the, when their season is over, they're yours. Get them in instructional league. Get them into uh, get them into low A ball if you think that they can uh, help a team out the rest of the the rest of the way. Well, the other question, Ron, that I have is what about what about you know young men in college who are in the College World Series? You know, I, I don't believe that tournament starts until the twenty sixth of May. Um, you know, what, what happens with those players? Uh, you know, I mean, those players continue playing, you know, in college. Oh, yeah, they'll be in college until their college season is over. But, but then, okay, then my point comes, okay, so, you know, let's say, you know, someone, you know, after they're eliminated, you know, can they become part of it? I, I, I Again, I just think there's some questions that I, you know, I, I'm sure, just not sure how this is all going to work and where these players are going to come from and, and so on and so on. Yeah, once, once the player's college team has been eliminated from the postseason, they would then be eligible uh, to join the team that uh, ultimately drafts them in this draft league. I, and, and I understand that. Now, what's this mean for high school players? Now, you know, are high school players, are, you know, are they going to skip this entire draft? Are they going to skip this league because, you know, let's say a high school season ends in, in May, uh, they're not – you know, their eligibility, you know, I mean, I think there's just some questions that, you know, we haven't been, you know, fulfilled cleared on, on answers yet. Well, the, the high school, the, the, the draft eligible kids from high school that get invited from uh, Prep Baseball Report, my, my guess is they're going to be allowed to take, uh, to take part in this league uh, because, you know, like the college kids, they're going to want to improve their draft status. But all of this is based on uh, whether 
prep baseball report and uh, invite you or not because they're the ones in charge of getting the the talent but yeah they, they once their high school season is over once they uh once their team uh, has been eliminated and their high school baseball season is over uh then they would automatically uh come on board and play in this league if they want to correct. if they want to exactly they could they could decline the invitation absolutely they could the other question is, is, is does the interest in, entrance in this league before you're drafted automatically ruin your eligibility for college? If, you, if you're playing this league, let's say you play in the league, you don't get drafted by a team, do you, can you still go play in college? Well, you're not getting season? paid. So, yeah. so you're not getting paid in this league, right? No, you're not getting paid in this league. Okay. So, yeah, so, it, so if, if there's a high school kid and he flops in this league, and winds up doesn't getting drafted. He can he can go back and say, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to college and and yeah, go to the but, and go to the school. But can he? Because that college is gonna have to be like. Well, yeah, he well, can he, because you know, he was never. Paid. I know he can, but but he can physically. But that college that he committed to early his senior year is gonna be like, well, you were committed to us. You went to this draft league, and we had to pick someone else because we didn't know if you were gonna be drafted or not. You see how that decision oh, kind of okay. goes into that, all that. I, I see where you're coming from with that. Yeah. It's a tangled web. <laughs> Anthony's uh, trying to uh, tangle a lot of webs. Uh, you know. <laughs> hey, uh, Dana, the YSU football and, and baseball and softball all in action over the weekend. Uh, let's talk about the football team first. Uh, it was it was a tough tough performance without Mark Wade. Uh, they they struggled offensively. Uh, they scored ten points. Uh, Wind up losing to Missouri State twenty-one to ten. I thought the defense played a solid game. Uh, yeah, they they did give up a couple of big plays that resulted in touchdowns, but uh, ultimately, I I thought that uh, YSU defensively played well. Offensively, they struggled without Mark Wade. Well, and again, I'm not going to throw this all on Wade, Ron. I, I think you know this is a team, you know, and, and again, we don't know what Wade would have done. Um, I'm not sure this team has a quarterback. Uh, to be quite honest, and, and I know Wade was was injured, um, you know, and I know it's his freshman year and, and so on and so forth. But I think really what YSU really has to look at is say, hey, do, do we have our our quarterback? Uh, Doug Phillips says, you know, it's seen you know seven of these teams now that he knows what type of players they need. Um, you know, does YSU have the quarterback? I think you know in in the off season. Um, you know they're going to have to make some improvements in some areas, but but again, I, I think you know you could have Mark Wade uh, at quarterback. I, I don't know if YSU would have won the game with Mark Wade. Um, you know he brings that other dimension of running the football, but you you got to have time to pass the football, and and, and no quarterback. Uh, you know Roman Gabriel couldn't stand back there. You know with the protection that this line is not giving, or the protection there. You know the quarterback isn't getting. Um, you know, the, the, the offensive line has made improvements from week one. But I think, you know, if, look, if you've got five guys blocked and you're sending six guys, I mean, you know, you're going to get to the quarterback. And, and, and again, um, you know, that, that's, that's, you know, the, the game plan that they have. I, I just don't know. I think there's a lot of questions. You know, and, and, and Ron, I guess, you know, I know you have one more game left, but it, it almost appears there's more questions now than there were in the beginning of the year. Um, in, in some ways, I agree with you. In, in, in some ways, I I think that we've seen some growth with this team. But but I agree with you. In 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 some cases, there are more questions right now, and uh, this is not going to be a slow turnaround. Uh, you know, four months from now, these guys are going to be back at it playing the fall season. I, I just don't know. You know, look, one area that's improved, I, I think, is the offensive line. Now, you know. Missouri State, you know, was leading the conference in sacks, and they didn't have a sack. Uh, you look what Western did last week. Western just blitzed, you know, blitzed the hell out of it. And, and you know, I mean, we're sending everybody. We're, we're Wade or anybody didn't have any time. So, you know, I, I, I don't know if there's, you know, I, in my opinion, and I'm no coach, I, I just think there's more questions. I think, do you have a quarterback, you know, that, that can lead this team? I think you have a running back in Jaleel McLaughlin. I think one of those questions they answered is McLaughlin will be your tailback for the next couple of years. Um, you know, do you have to make an improvement at receivers? I, I don't think there's any question you got to do that. Do you have that burner receiver? I'm not sure if we do. I think the tight ends are okay. Uh, you know, your kicking game, you know, I, I think it's okay. I mean, defensively, 
Um, you know, you played well. Um, you know, your secondary, you know, seems to be okay. So I, I think there's more questions on offense than, than really anywhere else. And I think, you know, they'll get a stern test this week against a good North Dakota team who's, you know, probably playing for a playoff spot. Um, so I, I just think, you know, look, Coach Phillips has said it many of times. You know, the best way to evaluate is by playing games. And now he has, you know, instead of a red-white game, he's got eight games to evaluate. So that will definitely help him. But I think, you know, you've you got to hit the ground running, whether you get transfers in. Um, you know, you you, you got to make some improvements between now and the fall. And while we're talking about football, last week you tweeted out that the OHS FCA sent out a survey to his coaches around the state, and you know, about the playoff teams, 12 or 16 in high school football. One, how do you think that survey will respond in the area, and then how much weight do you think those results of that survey will carry uh, as far as OHSA is to, you know, determining how many teams are going to be in the playoffs in the future? Well, the, the Ohio High School Football Coaches Association sent that survey out, and if past practices you know, continue, uh, you know, when the Football Coaches Association has a suggestion, you know, they take it to the Ohio High School Athletic Association, and, and they listen, now, whether they incorporate it or not, but I, I would say better than 50% of the time when the Football Coaches Association has a recommendation, the state A is going to listen and more than likely will probably, uh, you know, incorporate it. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I think this is a chance for the coaches association, uh, you know, to say, hey, do we want 16 teams? Because the biggest complaint I heard about 12 teams is, you know, when you play 10 regular season games, no one wants to buy. No one wants to take that week off because you're in a routine. And I, I think that's one of the questions. Now, you're banged up also after 10 weeks, but I think, you know, I think that's where the survey wants to go. Do you want to have a buy before the playoffs begin? All right, Dana, obviously last year, um, because of COVID, the OHSAA said, all right, we're going to uh, limit the season to six games, and then we're going to invite the whole state uh, to uh, to take part in this. Is there a way, and has the OHSAA internally, in your mind, or in, in, uh, in your view, thought of, let's let everyone play eight games and then continue with this, everyone in the state of Ohio is invited into the playoffs because you can end the season at the same time that you would end a regular football season, first week of December or second week of December, if you decide to play eight games and then let the entire state take part in the playoffs. Ron, I think, first of all, the bottom line of the Ohio High School Athletic Association, I shouldn't say the bottom line, one, one, of the, one of the goals of the Ohio High School Athletic Association is to make it fair and compatible with every institution in the state, every high school in the state, be it public, parochial, or, or private. I think coming off the year coming, we're, that the state is coming off, the reason they're kind of looking at this, or the coaches association is looking at this, or better yet, the Ohio High School Athletic Association is because they lost money, and, and I hate to say it, but money's the bottom line. Money is what makes the engine go. So if you take out the buy and you put in playoffs, and, and again, I, I don't think everybody being in the playoffs is something that's on the table right now. I think, you know, the, the 12 teams of what they want to do or maybe expanding that to 14 or 16 or whatever. Um, look, if you have 12, you're going to have five, so you got to take it to 16 if you want to continue the playoffs. But you got to you got to move up the season another week. Now you're beginning this season, you know, August 20th. Um, you know, with the with the bye week. So I think the state is looking at a couple of things. One, they're looking at how can we recoup some of the money we lost, and, and, and that's fair. I, I, don't, I don't think there's a problem with that. I, I think every company that is trying to do that. And two, can we handle it? Now, you handled it last year pretty well, but there were some, you know, there were some, it wasn't perfect. Uh, it certainly wasn't perfect. So I, I think they're going to look at everything. I think what you'll see is before everybody getting into the postseason, because I don't think they want to take away the 10-game the regular season. Um, 
you know, conference championships are still important to some institutions, to some leagues. I think the goal of reaching the playoffs has superseded that. But I think you'll see the playoffs perhaps go to 16 teams with no buy. But, again, you know, you, you got to look at when the season starts. And you're starting August 20th, and I, I can't ever remember this football season, the regular season starting that early. Yeah, and, and now, you know, when you look at the season and how it would lay out, I mean, there, I'm sure expanding the playoffs would open up a couple of questions and a couple of things that a lot of people don't even think about that it would open up, and there would be things that they would have to navigate if they were going to expand the playoffs and, and change the season schedule. I, I don't think, you know, and again, I think what they did in 2020 was was a great thing, okay? If you didn't go to the playoffs, you could still play your allotted 10 games, and, and I, I thought that was a great idea. I think in, in normal situations, you know, the Ohio High School Athletic Association wants to make sure that everything is, is, is fair, everything is, is you know. And, and, again, what you have to keep in mind is, you know, the seedings for, for, the, for the state playoffs were all done by the Coaches Association. In normal years, it's done by the Harbin system, you know, the computer rankings. So, you know, do you get a fair assessment with the computer rankings with eight games? You know, probably. Um, but, you know, you never know. I mean, you never know what can happen. Um, you know, I, I, I think the doors open on a lot of things. But I think having each team, you know, having the option to go to the postseason, I think that's something down the road. Um, you know, maybe maybe not at the top of the hill, maybe over the hill a little bit, and I still think they're they're climbing up the hill to kind of see what they want to do with the postseason. I think the the detractors of sixteen teams, and and they would be the same as the detractors of the twelve teams. Uh, listen, we already get enough blowouts in one versus eight and two versus seven. Uh, imagine what it's going to be when one plays sixteen, two plays fifteen three plays, 14, you'll have blowouts all over the place and mercy rule games all over the place in the first couple of weeks uh, well, of Ron, the tournaments. Again, I don't know, you know, again, now, now in 2020, the coaches, you know, did the seedings by, by a virtual vote. You know, you know, if you stay with the Harvard system, yeah, you're going to have that. But I think if you do it geographically, kind of like what the Coaches Association did this year, I, I, you know, you're still going to get some of those, but maybe not as many as, as you know. I, I mean, look, I, I think what they did last year, you know, in, in the situation they were in, they did a remarkable job, to be quite honest. I, I, thought, I thought the state, the Coaches Association, did, did a great job. You know, now if you go back to the Harvard system, you know, yeah, you're going to have one in 16. You're going to have mismatches. So I, I think you've got to say, okay, if we're going to go one to 16, then the coaches are going to vote on it. We're not going to have the Harvard systems anymore and, and leave it at that. Now let's talk about, uh, like, get back to YSU, the baseball softball team is both having successful weekends. You know, we, we talked about it before you got on baseball. When you win the first two, you kind of expect to win the series. They had to settle for a split, but still, you go into a road series and you want to at least split. So I would say a successful weekend for the baseball team. Softball team takes the uh, Horizon League lead with a three to one win over uh, Green Bay. Great weekend for Youngstown sports. Even the bowling team was in the Final Four. They couldn't uh, win the Final Four, but they they competed in the Final Four. So a great weekend for YSU sports. Yeah, you know, and again, baseball's playing well, softball's playing well. I mean, the bowling team, uh, you know, uh, I learned a lot about bowling last week with Baker games and that sort of thing. Certainly, uh, you know, when you go to the Final Four, uh, you know, that's the first time in school history a team has ever done that. Um, you know, baseball's playing well. You just hope the weather doesn't interrupt anything, you know, in, in this week, and you uh, try to get that top seat so you could host the Horizon League Championship games. Dana, before we let you go, I know you're a huge Browns fan. Uh, Jadavian Clowney reports coming out of Cleveland are he's going to sign with the Browns uh, as early as today. Now, that might be a fictitious report because uh, someone from the NFL Network uh, is reporting that Clowney may not even meet with the Browns until Wednesday. Uh, but Clowney is certainly on the Browns' radar. As a Browns fan, uh, what are your uh, thoughts of the... Browns going after the aging veteran. 
Well, again, he's, he's what, 28 years old. He played eight games last year. He seems to be injury prone. Um, he got paid $13 million by the Titans in 2020. I, I don't see, you know, how the Browns can pay that amount uh, for someone who, you know, played a half a season last year and has been injury prone. So, you know, the Browns will do their due diligence. And, Ron, look, there's a lot of smarter people, you know, running the show up there than I am. If, if he's a good fit, if he's, if he's physically fit, if, if the front office and Stefanski and Andrew Barry think that he can help this team, then by all means, you know, they'll do what they have to do. You just don't sign a guy to sign a guy. Um, you, know, you know, the Browns will do their due diligence. They're not going to throw money around. If he could step in and help them, then, then I'm all for it. Um, you know, last year they tried to get him. He decided to go to Tennessee. But, again, he was injury prone. Um, you know, he's 28 now, and, and uh, you know, not that that's old, but that's, you know, for NFL standards, he's not a young pup anymore. So, you know, I'm at the, uh, my opinion is if he could step in and be a force on that defense and add something to it, then by all means, the Browns will do what they have to do. If he can't, then you let him walk. Seems to me there's two or three edge rushers that uh, do a pretty nice job of stopping the run as well. Uh, that the Browns could probably invest in in this draft. Yeah, you'd probably have to trade some draft capital to move up and get a couple of these guys. Uh, but it seems to me they would be in a better position to do that. Don't spend the thirteen plus million dollars it'll probably take to get a clowny, get a guy, and get him for a rookie contract where he's going to be a member of your organization and come very cheap for the first four or five years. Well, I think you get. The Browns are in a position where, you know, people have taken notice. Free agents have taken notice that this team is on the upswing a little bit. So if they want to play for them, you know, they're going to do what they have to do as well. And, uh, you know, like I said, Ron, you never sign anyone just to sign them in any sport, in my opinion. If they fit, if they can help you, then that's when you determine, okay, he could be part of our football family. Dan, always a pleasure, sir. Look forward to catching up with you next week. Thanks, guys. You got it. Dana Ballage, 21 Sports Director, joining us on the MP Vivo Heating and Air Conditioning Hotline. Interesting uh, with the uh, football for the upcoming season and the OHSAA right. and how they may change some things that well, we uh, that we're frankly not we're not sure how the playoffs are going to work. They've right already now. said they want to. They, we're going to have at least 12. I think they've already come out and said you know 12. We're, we're not going to have eight anymore. But it'll be interesting to see how this survey with the coaches comes back because it might just say, like Dana said, it might just say we don't want the bye week. So to bypass the bye week, You're gonna have we're going to go move 16. to 16. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what the coaches around the state want and, and how that survey uh, comes back and then how much weight that survey holds when the OHS OH, – FCA always yeah that's not it. yeah OHSFCA takes it to the OHSAA and says this is what we got from the coaches. Well, Anthony, when we spoke with the coaches prior to the start of the playoffs, all of those coaches that had the buy in the first week were pissed that they had the buy, right? Because they didn't want to they didn't want to stop their momentum, uh, and and even even the kids that had. Uh, or the teams that had some kids that were banged up. Like Latonia. Like Latonia. Paul Lulia didn't want the buy. Mm-hmm. He said, no, we gotta we gotta keep playing here. So I I tend to I tend to think that if the OHSAA is going to listen to their coaches, then this will probably go sixteen teams and but but I'll if, be honest. If the survey comes back that way. Yeah, but I'll be honest, Anthony. I, I'm after what they did last year. I'm on board with play eight games and let everyone play the, in the playoffs and let's let's go. And if we uh, if the, the moment you lose, you want to play your final two games, have at it. Yeah, at some point, if you're going to let sixteen teams in, you have to you have to really think about what's the difference between. 16 and everybody. I mean... Yeah. Because when you get down to the, the bear, I mean, there aren't 16 high-quality, you know, huge record teams in a region. There just, no. There aren't. So, no. So then you had to scratch yourself and say, you know, what's the difference between 
you know, this uh, maybe three and if, if they're playing eight games, three and five team compared to this, you know, these four, two and eight, two and six teams that are playing different teams. But you know what I'm, you know, it, yeah. it starts to wonder if, if you're letting 16 in, you might as well just let everybody in. So we'll see how it goes. If 16 goes well and, and it's proceeded well, that might be the future. Honestly, I, I, I don't even. I don't think we're going to see everybody in this year. No. No. I think they're going to see how this goes um, and see what they get with 12 or 16. And if it's positive, then they might move forward in, in the years to come and say, let's start to put that on the table and, and see how we would do it. I mean, to be honest, because and, the other- and, and you can't make money on this, and, and I know that this isn't going to happen, and, and Dana brought this up. Money is, is the, the root of all of this. If we're going to be honest – the best tournament would be to knock it all the way down to the top four. If we're going to be honest, because one versus eight, two versus seven, you get blowouts in an eight in an eight team region. You, you get, get a lot of blowouts. Up, you also get upsets. You do. No, uh, you, you I do. Think, I think the best the best the best quality was one through eight because there's usually eight teams that you can really say deserve to be in the playoffs, deserve to. Have a playoffs either seven and three, whatever. Usually, teams that aren't aren't better than seven and three don't get into the playoffs with eight teams. Yeah. So you can say, okay, they had a great season, seven and three. Some of them played extremely good teams, and they deserve to be in a uh, in a playoff. But so that was probably the best quality of football as far as the turn a whole tournament went. Well, you can you can have a team like a Cardinal Mooney and an Ursuline who, uh, and I believe uh, both of them are D four. Well, one might be D five now. I think Mooney was D five this year. Actually, they were. They played. Uh, yeah, they played, they played Garrettsville, Garfield. Uh, so you could you could have a team like Cardinal Mooney who does not play a Division five schedule. Let's be honest. And they almost beat and, Garfield, who was one of the top teams in the. Yeah. So so I mean they they could be five and five and still be in the top mm-hmm. eight because their five wins are going to come against or are going to be Division three, Division two, or Division one programs. Uh, the computer is going to be very nice to them uh, because they're scheduling up. So, and then if you go undefeated against a bunch of Division Six teams, it's not going to be. Nice it's to not you. going to be nice to you. Yeah. So, uh, especially it, if the teams you the, beat all wound up with losing records, it won't be nice to you. That's the the computers make the scheduling a little bit more important because a lot of coaches that don't see these teams look at an undefeated season and just be like, okay, you were in the top three seed or whatever. Yeah. Because they're they're not gonna they don't have the time to dive into your schedule and see who you played. Yeah, exactly. But the computer does. <laughs> it's got all the time in the world. So scheduling becomes a little bit more important when it's computer rankings. Yeah. But you can't do computer rankings when you're gonna do twelve or sixteen teams. Gotta have coaches vote on that. So, yeah. Well, it's so we'll see how it goes. I'll be I'll be very curious to see how this works. Um, you know, again, I'm not a fan. I mean, if if we're gonna go more than eight teams. Then let them all in, and let's play an eight-game regular season, and let everyone in. Everyone makes all kinds of money, especially the OHSAA. They make oodles and oodles of money if everyone plays in the playoffs. Uh, and and then the same format goes where okay, if you if you get bounced, you can play your final two regular season games and go from there, uh, and everyone is happy, uh, especially the OHSAA because they could count all their Benjamins and their Skittles. All right, three three zero eight eight six zero eight one three. The MP Vivo Heating and Air Conditioning Hotline open for business. Uh, we do have uh, uh, baseball tonight. Uh, the Indians are playing the White Sox out in Chicago. This will be a four game series uh, with the White Sox. Tristan McKenzie, who looks like Karen Carpenter and throws like Chris Carpenter. Is on the mound and, for the uh, and scares uh, other and scares other teams like John Carpenter. Yeah, there you go. Uh, 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 he is on the mound for the Indians. Uh, how about those Pirates? Man, they laid the wood on uh, on Chicago. And actually, there was a little bean bore, uh, bean ball activity going right. on uh, yesterday, in which the umpires kind of put the kibosh on it pretty well, quickly, much to the chagrin of the of the uh, Cubbies. That's the only thing the umpires did well this weekend because they missed a couple of, oh, my gosh, that's obviously the other way calls that or went to replay and still didn't get reversed. For, for what? You can't possibly be talking about that. Mm, 
Sunday night game. Uh, the Braves getting screwed oh out gosh. of a run. Uh, or or the getting screwed out of an out. He, I mean, <laughs> my word. <laughs> Well, that and, and the Otani play where where uh, he got swept up uh, at home plate. Yeah. Well, in fairness to the home plate umpire in the game well, in which we're all going to complain about Atlanta and Philadelphia, where the run or the runner could have been called out. In fairness, I think the umpire looked and saw the foot. Might or might not have touched the plate, but he beat the throw. He is safe. If you're if you're assuming the guy touched home plate, he's definitely safe. If you're assuming he's touching home plate. Problem is, he never touched home plate. Well, the, the problem is the replay showed that he And the t- replay <laughs> kind of sort of maybe showed that he didn't touch home plate, but it wasn't enough to overturn it. So everyone's now pissed off about it because, well, why the hell do we have replay? To which I say, I've been saying that for years. We ba- Major League Baseball no, no, no. should here's, not have replay. Here's the reason why we have replay, because despite, we'll get we'll get like three of those in a season where you go, oh my gosh, how'd they miss that they have replay? But you'll get, uh, you'll get 15 or 16 where it's, they missed it, replay went, got it right, and it, it needs to be right. I get it, but so I, I, I calls need to be right, and and they're gonna have ones where you, we we scratch their head. It's I, gonna happen in baseball. I, I miss the manager going out and but, arguing and making a big old deal out of it. Well, nothing changes with that though. Well, like, the well, umpires are gonna be like, well, you know what, you're right. He's safe. Well, no, I mean, but still, it's 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 if, theatrical to watch an umpire I, go out and and raise hell. The one thing I don't like about we talked about this a couple weeks ago. I don't like stolen bases being examined by replay because it used to be. The only way the the whole attack can be out was if you made an attempt to round the base. So if you, you know that that was the old rule before replay. Like now, all of a sudden, if your hand pops up, or, or barely for like a half a second, and the tag's on you, you're out. You're out. Even if you beat the throw by a mile, uh, you're out. Keep your hand on the, and, on the, but on it's, the bag. But that's encouraging injury, because now people are going to drive their hands into the bag to try to stay on. And it's gonna break fingers and break wrists. The foot, the foot slide is gonna break ankles because people are gonna be jamming their feet in the bag to make sure they stay on. When in the old days, if you went over, the only way you were called out is if you made an attempt to continue. Yeah. That that was like the old school because no umpire was gonna see that you stepped off. Well, you also did not second and be like. Yeah, but you also didn't. Have so the second baseman or the shortstop I just keeping think, the tag on the on the I know, base stealer. I just think it, it's making stealing a lot more dangerous to have this like microscope on whether or not the hand left the bag for a, a micro of a second. Because now you're you're telling these stealers that you really have to stay on the bag, which is almost impossible when you're coming in hot. And unless you really plant your foot on that bag, which increases your likelihood of injury, you're going to pop your foot off. That's why the foot pops off, because you're bracing that impact so you're not taking it all on your ankle. Your foot pops off. Yeah, you're, you're, trying, to, so you're trying to get the heel on have, the bag and keep the heel on the bag. I feel like it's making stealing bases more dangerous, which is why might be more coaches are not willing to take chances on their star players stealing bases. Well, that the like fact for, they don't want they don't want any outs. Well, yeah, but so. like for the Royals example, one of their best base dealers is Whit Merrifield. But now that the you know the, the injury is a lot more likely, I think Mike Matheny might be like, if we we might not send Whit Merrifield as much as we used to because you got to really drive your hand into that bag to make sure, and if he breaks his hand, we're screwed. I agree with that. So I mean, you guys are pretty much screwed anyway because you're not as talented as the rest of the rest of the division, except for Detroit. But you just split with White Sox. So I get that. I, I get that. You can hush. I, I, I get that. <laughs> I, 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 listen, I get that. You can hush. Uh, I'm just Four saying. And you know, in a, we split with you guys. In, too. In, a, in, a, in a span of 162 games, it's not going to look pretty for you guys, but that's okay. You'll 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 get there. I'm writing this down. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, now, would it would it be safer for Major League Baseball to say? I just think they could go uh, like um, 
unless it's either blatant or you're making an attempt to round the bag, once you hit the bag, and, and I know this is going to be objective because then you go, oh, did he beat the throw? Did you not beat the throw? But there's got to be something where they go and say, okay, if your hand popped off for half a second, then then you're you're okay. Well, I think ultimately what should happen is as soon as the person is safe, you call time. Now, right now, I will say, and I've been told this, when a, when a player steals a bag and says time, you don't give them the timeout. Why? I have no idea. But you, you're you're just like no, it's we're gonna we're gonna continue on, and then when when it's all done with. Then we'll give you the time. As far as I'm concerned, if a kid steals the bag and he asks for time, you should immediately call for timeout, and then that's it. And I don't care if the kids, if the defender has the has the ball in his glove and the glove is put on the player's hip. I don't care at this point. Timeout. He asks for time. Timeout. He can dust himself off. Right. He just stole the bag, and all this Mickey Mouse crap goes away. That you can do that, or you you simply just say once the play is over, okay, you get rid of the ball. We're not doing this this BS with you putting the ball and and leaving it on the on the uh, on the player. It's the same thing over at first base when a guy's getting picked off or <laughs> or leading off at first base that, and dives back to the bag. The first baseman that, is leaving uh, that glove right. on the player as if to say, all right. Uh, where are you going to go here? That happened uh, in the game, the Royals game against the White Sox. Carlos Santana was holding the, the, the glove on his hip even like before, after he stood up, just like in chest. And the, I forget what White Sox hitter it was. He went and smacked it away. Yeah. So then Carlos, you know, he, he thinks he's a, he's a smart aleck. He took his glove, put it on his shoulder for a couple of seconds. <laughs> you know, you have fun with it. But, yeah, you're right. I mean, they, they, I just think there's got to be something to just to, – because to, I'm getting tired of – you beat the throw by a mile. I mean, you clearly are safe. And then because your hand popped off for, for a split second, yeah. replay says you're out. That's the only thing I don't like about replay. Everything else I'm for, you know, you get it right, you're going to have – like I said, you're going to have four or five plays during a season naturally that – for one reason or another, the replay booth didn't see it, and everyone in America thinks they did, and it's like, oh, why do we have replay? This, yeah. this is clearly well, safe, la- he's wrong. Uh, last night, but, it was, there was nothing clearly out or clearly um, safe about last night's call. A majority of the plays happen because the umpire gets it wrong, and the replay comes and says, we're, we're going to get it right. Yeah. And that's what it should be. Yeah. Well, last night was not clearly out or clearly safe because, you know, you see the foot... Well, he didn't but, but touch. I, the bottom of the spike could have touched the could have touched home plate. We don't know. That's why they couldn't overturn that call. But a lot of America thinks. That but but everyone's America. looking at that and like, oh, well, this is this was a horrible call. Well, you know, I mean, if we're and I and I can't blame the umpire for this. You know, the the foot goes across home plate. You're going to assume and be ninety nine point nine percent accurate when the foot crosses home plate. Hey, he touched home plate. Well, in this case, he may not have touched home plate. The foot, here's the plate, and the foot's like, and he didn't touch home plate, but it goes over. Well, okay, he's safe. Well, maybe not, because did he touch the home plate instead of just gliding his foot over home plate? Because there is no question that foot beat the tag. That foot went over the plate before the tag was made. The runner's safe. If he touched home plate, that's the million dollar question that we're never going to get an answer of. Because the kid from Philadelphia was like, I was safe. Uh, you know, I don't know if that's his smart ass view of <laughs> saying, well, the umpire said I was safe, so I'm safe. Or if he's saying, matter of factly, hey, I was safe. Well, of course he was safe. What's he going to come out and say, no, nah, man. Nah, he beat I me. escaped, he beat me, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> And the and Academy the, Award goes to... And all the Braves fans can suck it. Yeah. You know? uh, well, I mean, it just, it was, it is what it is. Uh, that was... Um, I was surprised they sent him because that was a shallow pop fly and Acuna's got a pretty good arm. Yeah, it was like only 210 feet. Uh, but I from, guess in the top of the ninth tie game, you just go for it. And make you make the defense make the play. It's ballsy. And that's what happened. I mean, there's something to be said about, even if it's a, a high-risk uh, play... Making the defense make that play, rather than just saying, "Oh, you know, you can go ahead with it," 
sometimes the throw's not exactly where it needs to be, and, and you can you can buy a score off of it. So well, it, I, I like it. I like the aggressiveness. Listen, I mean, the uh, it, it was only 220 feet, if that. So the third base coach, and I'm and I'm looking here real quick uh, to um, uh, to figure out who the third base coach is. Uh, Dusty Wathan uh, is the third base coach. Uh, that that's just a hell of a job by Dusty. I mean, okay, I'm going to gamble here, and uh, and here's what we're going to do. Well, gamble pays off. That was uh, that was a solid move. Solid move. All right, three three zero eight eight six zero eight one three. We'll take a timeout. Be back with more. It is a Monday edition of Running Point presented by Running uh, presented by presented, presented by, by Running Point. <laughs> yeah, okay. Presented by Greenwood Chevrolet on Mahoning Avenue in Austin Town. Back in a bit. Quality, customer service, and integrity. Those are the four words that have driven our success since 1957 at Joe Dickey Electric. Joe Dickey Electric is one Mahoning Valley landmark business that stays current with the requirements of our customers. Family owned and managed, we are an electrical contractor and energy solutions provider. Every member of our team adds to his or her skill set through ongoing training. Residential, commercial, industrial, automotive, and more. We keep ahead of the needs of our customers with a fleet of more than 50 vehicles and 24-7 emergency service, so you're never left in the dark. The 4M company, being an architect and construction manager for over 40 years, has had the opportunity to use many different electrical businesses for our projects. The depth, quality, and knowledge and attention to detail displayed by Dickey Electric makes them stand out above all the rest. For state-of-the-art expertise and a timeless commitment to our customers, contact Joe Dickey Electric. We are everything electrical. News doesn't stop after the sun goes down. Sometimes you just have to hustle to get it. At 21 News, no matter how far it is, no matter what it takes to get there, we're working to bring you the best stories and the freshest content at 11 p.m. with the context and clarity that makes it worth staying up for, no matter what time it is. 21 News at 11 with me, Aaron Simonek and Derek Steyer. 21 News at 11, news that's worth your time. When looking for home design inspiration, don't just be inspired, be Baird inspired. Whether new or remodeling, Baird Brothers has the latest trends like shiplap to refresh your home. Go from inspiration to installation with our wide selection of in-stock American hardwoods. From the rustic charm of antique oak to the warmth of traditional cherry, Baird Brothers has what you need to make your home inspiring. Baird Brothers, our family's heritage, your family's home. Welcome back to a Monday edition of Running Point presented by Greenwood Chevrolet on Mahoning Avenue in Austintown. The MPV Vo Heating and Air Conditioning Hotline open for business. 330-886-0813. That's 330-886-0813. Uh, coming up at 2 o'clock, we will hear from the uh, voice of the YSU Football Penguins. Uh, Bob Hannon will be joining the show at 2 o'clock. Uh, somebody asked me over the weekend if uh, you and I were going to be doing another mock draft uh, with the NFL draft coming up. And um, I believe we are going to... Uh, we are going to have a little bit of fun with this, with the did, mock draft. Did they remember how bad last year's went for us? Well, we were 5 <laughs> out of 10. I mean, we, we, did, we did okay. I think we went 3 out of the first 10 because we had to go all the way to, like, pick 15 to break our little bet. <clears throat> well, uh, I think we're going to be 3 for 3 uh, to well, this year. It's all going to be, like, which, which quarterback goes in what spot, though. I mean, <clears throat> we can say three quarterbacks. But... Well, Trevor Lawrence is going one. Right. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, the kid from BYU is probably going to go too. But then again, this is the Jets. They may uh, they may wind up doing something stupid because they are the Jets after all. Uh, I would think the 49ers are going to um, are going to go with a kid from Alabama, Mac Jones. But uh, one never knows. Uh, that leaves uh, Fields with, see, from Ohio State. Did, but people are saying, and and I tend to agree that. The 49ers might be leaning towards Fields because 
that system fits a little bit better with a Reed Hopkins quarterback. It could. Yeah, I, and I he mean, might, it could. And he, he's much more of a Reed Hopkins quarterback than, than Mac Jones. He's more of a pocket, you know, old school type of stay in the pocket, make your throws kind of player. And, and Kyle Shanahan, he, he runs – an offense that, despite Jimmy G, kind of may lean towards you know a a run off, a read option type quarterback. The team I would love to be right now is Atlanta at four. Because... Well, no one wants to be Atlanta because that's just a bet. Well, <laughs> I was just making a joke. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, I know. That's, I, I understand. To... Uh, Atlanta's known choke. for choking. Don't a few choke things. on your food. Yeah, yeah, they've been known to choke a few uh, a few things, but. Um, Atlanta has an opportunity to possibly get the best player in this draft, in my humble opinion, and that's the tight end from Florida. Because if the top three teams are going to go quarterback crazy, Atlanta can sit back and go, okay, we'll take the best player in this draft and take the tight end out of Florida and just go from there. Uh, and that might extend Matt Ryan's career another couple of years to have another uh, toy in the uh, in the tool chest for uh, for Matty Ice, he needs uh, he needs protection. Is what he needs. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> no, that, and you can get some offensive linemen in the uh, second and third round, but you know, for me, uh, if I, I, I as a Bills fan, I would because B- Buffalo doesn't have a tight end per se. Although Dawson Knox pretends to be one, I would love to jump from thirty all the way to four, but it would cost a first round pick in the next three drafts, this one 21 and probably 22 just to have the value to go from 30 all the way up to number four. I feel like um, it's also going to be interesting to see what the Patriots do in this draft and what does, what direction they decide to go. Well, I know you don't want to hear that because they're the, uh, listen, but uh, I have, I have a vision of the new England Patriots calling Atlanta up and saying, Hey, you, you but, know, we kind of want this fourth pick. It's an opportunity for you guys to screw us uh, since we took your Super Bowl. Uh, I could see New England, especially if Fields is available. I could see New England saying, call Atlanta. Let's give up a couple of first-round draft picks and and uh, some more of our draft capital yeah. and say, let's, t- let's get Fields. They'd have to give up a lot. And they don't have a lot as far as on their roster. So they'd have to give up draft capital. And I don't know if it's worth it. Well, they will gain some draft capital back. Because G- Stefan Gilmore is leaving New England. He's going to get traded. And my guess is uh, they'll finagle him uh, to Cleveland for a second round pick of some sort. And they'll, uh, and they'll get some extra draft capital. But... I mean, yeah, it would cost an awful lot to to get the fourth pick, but if the Patriots organization believes in Fields or whoever is left, it wouldn't surprise me if they jump up and say, hey, let's grab that fourth pick. And that would leave Cincinnati at five salivating because it would be the tight end out of Florida, and all of a sudden Joe Burrow has lots of toys in the, you know, in the, in the, toy, uh, in the uh, toy closet to work with. Uh, and Cincinnati's going to be a fun team to watch anyway, even though they're mismanaged. Uh, I, I think that's still going to be a fun team to watch. So to so answer the question, yes, we are going to do a little draft, something, something. I think uh, being it's, that it's coming up here pretty quickly. It would be a, uh, a shame to not do one with, without McNuggies, because he just owned that draft party we had uh, last year. He's like our draft guru, so we might have to have him on the phone for that. Where is he? Where is? He? Yeah, where is our where where uh, is our nuggy? <laughs> and, I mean, uh, he he did kill it on draft night. Oh, he nailed it. Yeah, um, and then he he did so well that we made uh, the second night of the draft. We we put him on on again, and people loved listening to his him and his notebook and and what he brought to the table. So. He's smarter than both of us combined when well, it comes to draft. Yeah, it was uh, it was pretty interesting. He nailed it. Yeah, it was pretty interesting to uh, to hear other people's opinions on this for sure. Uh, but yeah, we will uh, we will have a uh, a draft preview and it should be entertaining. So uh, hopefully, uh, our teams draft wisely and 
Well, yeah. I mean, you guys are picking thirty Chiefs, first. We're picking thirtieth. It's it's not it's not brain science. The Chiefs need the offensive lineman, and they need depth at the cornerback position. Uh, a little bit, maybe a uh, maybe some run stoppers. And I wouldn't be surprised if they try to get a receiver out of the draft because they went after Juju, so they obviously want someone that's tall and strong. Uh, to, to help in the red zone because as fast as Tyreek Hill, McCole Hardman, and, and and Robinson are, they're they're on the smaller side. They don't really help you a lot inside the 10-yard Yeah, line. and Sammy Watkins is now in Baltimore. Right, and so. he didn't help a lot in the red no. zone either because he was small and fast. Yep. I mean, so I think they might be looking for maybe a taller receiver that's strong and they can go up and get uh, red zone touchdowns so it's not like in the red zone, hey, let's double Travis Kelsey and, no, you know, then the Chiefs are like, well, now what? <laughs> well, there's there, there's a couple of uh, so, receivers that fit that bill that they could wanna, probably get in the second or third. Day I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a homer, but Georgia Tech has a guy named uh, Jalen Camp who's six two two twenty five that uh, bench pressed two I think uh, two hundred twenty five pounds in thirty two reps, which is more than any receiver had done at the combine or a pro day since two thousand and three. Wow! So he's strong. He's six two. Uh, he knows how to block because you have to when you grow up at Georgia Tech. He spent two years in that option offense. So when now, no, obviously not an option offense anymore. But when you're in that option offense, you got to learn how to block. And so he's going to be a good blocking receiver as well. I think that'd be someone that the Chiefs could look at down the road in, in, in the second or third day of the draft. Yeah, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, and, I mean, 6'2", you know, we'll, 225, that's a big boy. That's... And when you can Pretty bench, size. when you can bench two hundred, when you can bench basically your own body weight thirty-two times, that, that's yeah, that's, that's not impressive. bad, not too shabby, not too shabby. And he, uh, ran, he ran a four four forty too, by the way. So when you're running four four and you're as a freak of an athlete, right? So that he had a he had a heck of a pro day at Georgia Tech. Yeah, and people are like, oh, this. He was even on the NFL Network. I mean, they 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 they, they highlighted him as one of the receivers they were going to highlight. So. Um, he might go. Be interesting to see what happens. I, I know that um, there's an awful lot of talent in certain positions. Uh, the draft is deep and real uh, in in a couple of positions. The DNs, edge rushers, it's pretty deep. Wide receivers, it's uh, it's somewhat deep. Uh, and then it's really crappy in other positions. So um, be curious to see how this works out. But I, I'm pretty sure the uh, the first three picks – should be pretty easy. Yeah. Uh, Trevor Lawrence, kid from BYU, and, and really, probably they were the last kid from year Alabama. Too. I mean, last year we got the first three, bang, 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 and yeah. then, then it got dicey. Yeah, and then it got dicey. <laughs> so it, it's uh, it, it'll be it'll be interesting. Uh, but long long story short, yes, we will have a uh, a draft preview and have a little bit of fun with it. So uh, it should be fun. Uh, again, uh, the uh, story out of that was making the rounds out of Cleveland was. Jadavian Clowney signing with the Browns as early as today. Uh, But now, uh, apparently, uh, Ian Rappaport is reporting uh, that the Clowney may not even meet the Browns until Wednesday. So, is Clowney clowning the Browns at this point? You're just waiting to pull that one out. Uh, Well, I'm I'm just, you know, I I, I aim to please. You're humming them out today on a Monday. I Um, I aim to please. What can I tell you? We've already talked about the negative aspects of signing Davian Clowney because we talked about this last week, but I do want to be devil's advocate on the other side and be whether it's earned or not, that name gets a lot of attention on other team scouting reports. It does. I mean, Jadavian Clowney on that side, we, we got to watch him because whether he's put up the, the numbers in the NFL or not, he kind of strikes fear into other, other teams, you know, scouting report. He demands that attention. So it would be someone that would maybe take attention off of Miles Garrett more than a rookie who might not garner all the attention because you know teams are going to be like, well, he hasn't proven himself yet. Um, so he might draw that scouting report attention from other teams away from Miles Garrett. He so does that, a nice a job. He does a nice job stopping the run. Mm-hmm. He doesn't do a nice job of passing or, uh, uh, pass rushing anymore. Not that I don't. Th- I don't think he ever did a great job of pass rushing per se. Well, he's um, never had a double digit sack this season. So that's that's yes. You are you are correct in that. But he has stopped the run pretty well um, defensively. So then I can see that would be the allure uh, of attraction for the Browns because 
let's face it, the Browns, they weren't able to stop very much running-wise. Um, so if you add a Jadavian Clowney, they become a lot better at stopping the run, which will go a long way to uh, the progression of the linebackers because you don't want the linebackers to be forced to uh, uh, get blocked because your defensive line is getting screwed at the line of scrimmage, and then your uh, linebackers are getting blocked, and all of a sudden, guys running into the secondary where your strong safety and your corners and your free safety have to make tackles, uh, you don't want to do that. So uh, Clowney does stop the run pretty well. It's just he he's never been a prototypical pass rusher. Uh, he's overrated in that regard. And I will I will argue he has made a career on one snapshot play in college football where he destroyed someone from Michigan. Right. And uh, I always thought that play was overrated anyway because he wasn't blocked. He wasn't blocked. blocked. I mean, he just he had a head of steam and he – Knock this guy into in the next Tuesday, uh, so it was I mean a hell of a play, but he was unblocked. I mean, of course he's going to do that. And any any player worth their salt would have done the exact same thing because he wasn't blocked. Back when SportsCenter would keep number like the number one play of the and they'd keep it until it gets beat by voting. I believe that play was on like number top ten for a whole you know two months because this. <laughs> Everyone loved watching that. It was just one of those ones, one of those plays that's like, yeah, gotta watch it. And, yeah. and I, I never was that impressed by it. All right, Bob Hannon coming up next. We'll talk YSU football. Stick around. Hello, I'm Greg Burbick with G. Burbick Farms. For the last hundred years, my family has farmed in the Columbiana and Mahoning counties. I began raising cattle in 1996 with the goal of providing a better product for you and your family on the dinner table. Our grass-fed and grain-supplemented black Angus beef were raised with no hormones, steroids, or antibiotics. We are known for our hometown-friendly service and incredible tasting products. We are locally owned and have customers across the tri-state area. Our products go from our farm to your family. Stop by our farm on New Buffalo Road or visit us on the web at gburbickfarms.com. Don't forget to like us on Facebook. G. Burbick Farms, it just tastes better. This is Tommy Clem, owner of WRS Insurance Solutions. WRS Insurance Solutions is a local, independent agency that specializes in life, Medicare, long-term care, and disability products. Call us at 330-953-3722 or visit us at wrsinsurancesolutions.com to learn more. Good luck to all the student-athletes in the Valley. Right now is a great time to get more for your trade-in at Tri-State Ford and drive home in a new or pre-owned vehicle. Choose from our great selection of new Ford models or pre-owned vehicles. Plus, get the Tri-State Ford Advantage, including a 10-year, 200,000-mile warranty and more. At Tri-State Ford, we'll pay you top dollar for your trade, but you don't have to purchase one of ours to sell us yours. Customer focus, community driven. Tri-State Ford East Liverpool or visit TriStateFord.net. Jimmy Sudman here, director of Isle, Purple Cat, and Golden String. We are happy to support YSN and two of my favorite people, Scotty Mincher and Super Dave O'Malley. We are an agency that provides services for adults with disabilities. We infuse humor, passion, and joy into their lives. If you know of any folks with disabilities that need our assistance, please contact us. Welcome back to the Monday edition of Running Point presented by Greenwood Chevrolet on Mahoning Avenue in Austintown. Uh, Anthony Hartwig, Ron Potesta with you, and we are joined on this Monday afternoon during Penguins football season. That is so weird saying football in spring. Uh, Bob Hannon joining us on the MP Vivo Heating and Air Conditioning Hotline. Bob, how are you today, sir? I'm doing well, Ron. Fortunately, we didn't come back with a win, but Monday off to a good start. All right, so the Penguins lose to Missouri State 21-10 to on uh, Saturday. You made mention in the postgame show that I think you're, you're 100% accurate on this. 
despite the fact that he has a horrible reputation in FBS and Nash and the uh, National Football League. Um, I thought that Bobby Petrino, uh, who is doing a uh, or trying to um, pick up the pieces and and improve his reputation around football, I think Bobby Petrino has done an amazing job with Missouri State this year. Well, Ron, when you look at where they were to where they are now, he came in with one of the you know, taking over really one of the worst programs in the country. They hadn't made the playoffs since 1990, no winning season since 2009. And, and, and more often than not, just getting beaten up pretty badly. And then in the fall, they go 0-3. But it looked like after the 49 nothing loss to Oklahoma, which most FCS teams would lose to Oklahoma, if not all FCS, they were pretty competitive against Central Arkansas. And then they brought a handful of players in mid-year, and, and they hit the mark on, on most of those players, a couple cornerbacks and uh, a few other guys on the offensive line that came in and helped right away. And now they sit five and one in the conference. Um, that's impressive. Uh, now, can he keep it going and sustain it? We're going to see. But I do know that they have a true freshman running back in Manning and a redshirt freshman quarterback and uh, and Jane Johnson who came in. So they've got some skilled players that are that are pretty young that are going to be there for a few years. Man, with all those points that you made about the changes they made in the in the middle of the the you know after fall before spring, they're a different team now. They have some new people in the run. I just we talked about this early in the show with Ron. I can't see keeping them out of the playoffs if things work out where South Dakota State beats North Dakota State and, and they're sitting at a, at a two spot or, or winning the, the Missouri Valley Conference. If they win it, they're in. Even if they don't and they end up in the top two or three, I just I, if, if, they ke- if they're kept out, I hope it's not because they went 0-3 in the fall against Central Arkansas and Oklahoma. No, Anthony, it's a tough call. I think the best scenario for Missouri State to get to the playoffs is if YSU beats North Dakota. That'll give North Dakota two losses, and then North Dakota State or South Dakota State, one of those two would be in for sure, the winner of the game Saturday. And then it might come down to you know who, who gets in, that, that the loser of that game of Missouri State. Now, if they would take three teams, then they'd be sitting in pretty good shape. But if, if North Dakota State gets in or South Dakota State and then North Dakota beats YSU, they're probably going to take those two for sure, the winner of the Saturday game in Fargo and in North Dakota. I don't know if they'll hold it against them, but I think it's going to play into it a little bit. Uh, their only loss in the league was 25 uh, nothing to North Dakota State. They look like a playoff team. and I would think right now they're one of the 16 best teams in the country. I think it'll probably come down to what happens to North Dakota against the Penguins, and will they take three teams uh, to the postseason? Yeah, you know, I feel bad for whoever made the uh, T-shirts <laughs> in uh, Springfield, Missouri, because um, and and you made mention of this in the post-game show, and and I uh, doubled down on it because it's true. Uh, North Dakota State did beat Northern Iowa, uh, so Missouri State and North Dakota State are tied with five and one records. South Dakota State and North Dakota are four and one. Uh, if North Dakota State beats South Dakota State on Saturday, they're six and one. They win the league, and all of a sudden, whoever made those shirts saying Missouri <laughs> State, Missouri Valley Football Conference champions, uh, they're not looking too smart. Uh, but if South Dakota State knocks off North Dakota State, then all is right in the world, and they are the Missouri Valley Football Conference champs. Right, exactly. They will be. They'll, they'll, and that even adds to you know, their argument to get into the playoffs if they're a conference champion. So there's a lot going on this weekend. Hopefully all the games will get played. Um, and if they are played this weekend, YSU will be the only team in the conference to play all eight games and not have had their season interrupted by COVID. You know, I, I, uh, I have had all kinds of fun ripping Western Illinois uh, for doing what they did. Uh, and, and it started midweek uh, this, this past week, and I'm continuing to do it. Uh, look, I mean, I'm mad at Illinois State. Okay, I, it, Illinois State bailed earlier in the year. But for Western Illinois, this is a team, and their only reason, and I think what bothers me uh, is when they flat-out lied to everyone and said, this is for the safety of the kids. Bull, it's not for the safety of the kids. You won the only game that you could have possibly won on your schedule, and that's how you're going to celebrate by saying, peace out, we'll see you guys in the fall. That 
bothers me to no end. And it's and it's also thrown a monkey wrench into how many teams from this league are going to go into the playoffs because of that cowardly act and Illinois State's cowardly act. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I, I think that, you know, once you commit to play, I would think when the season began, when the presidents and athletic directors committed to play, they, they figured everybody would be all in. Unless you got completely, you know, blasted with COVID and lost all your offensive or defensive linemen or didn't have any quarterbacks, that might be different. But that didn't happen in Illinois State or Western Illinois. Both cited, you know, injuries or potentially getting hurt. Uh, it was bad, Ron. You know, they got their win and they bailed on the rest of the season. They also had two road games coming up. Um, maybe they didn't want to make the travel. The excuse that, you know, didn't want to pay to travel. Then don't compete. Don't. I mean, that, that's ridiculous that you make a statement like that is that some of that was coming out of Western, that they didn't want to go on the road for two games. And in the game against us, they didn't really seem to have any significant injuries after they beat YSU 27-24. So it wasn't like a bunch of guys went down that night. So it is, it is a shame um, that, you know, look at Missouri State. They, they, if they could have got two more games in, not, not saying they would have won them, but they may have, and it would put them in a lot better position to, to have that argument that they should be in the playoffs. So... At some point, maybe, you know, Western and Illinois State, you know, Carmel will come back on them, but I thought it was a bad move, too. Indiana State, that's different. They, they bailed before the season began, uh, so at least they did it before they played any games. I feel like when fall comes around, there's going to be a storm coming for uh, uh, Illinois State, but especially Western Illinois, for, for doing what that, that they did. I feel like when, when you get that team on your schedule, it's going to be circled more than it would be because normally it says, okay, let's just go to Western Illinois and take care of business. Now it's let's make sure these guys understand how we feel about what they did. And there's going to be no mercy. There's going to be no uh, uh, sympathy cards. And, and I think they might have a storm coming in the fall. Now, there could be some retribution. I could see some payback coming for some teams for sure. I know Southern Illinois coach Nick Hill, he's been very vocal about it. He, he's, he's not held back. He made some comments on Twitter. And then Doug Phillips said last week on the pregame, unless the floor completely fell out here and not injuries, COVID, uh, you know, completely wiping us out, which would force us to cancel a game or two. There was no way they were not going to try to get every game in. And I think it's benefited. I know they're just sitting at one and six, but hopefully it'll, it'll help come fall and, I think it'll be a, like a free agent off season. I mean, what's going to happen in the portal? Our team's going to, you know, dramatically look different next year. How many teams that have seniors will have those seniors come back if they've graduated? So it'll be a quick turnaround, and I do think some teams will go out and significantly try to improve in the portal. I know Coach Phillips said uh, Western Illinois, from what he is hearing, is already actively, you know, going through that portal to see who they can come in and get guys to fill gaps to play right away. Hey, Bob, I thought the game on Saturday turned around when the Missouri State starting quarterback uh, took a uh, knee to the helmet. Uh, Jaden Johnson came in. Boy, did the offense respond uh, when Jaden Johnson came into the ball game. The redshirt freshman uh, led the Bears on three scoring drives. Uh, and, you know, honestly, I think that had Jaden Johnson not come into this game, Youngstown State had a really good chance at knocking off Missouri State because Missouri State wasn't going uh, uh, very far with with their starting quarterback. You know, Struck was the starter. You're right, Ron. They were struggling. They weren't moving the ball at all, and he's, he's more of a passer than he is runner. And I don't know if they would have pulled the trigger anyway because he wasn't playing well or they were going to stick with uh, the starter. Uh, but you're right. Once Johnson came in, he made a big run on a third down play. Uh converted and then they came downfield and scored he gives them uh, the dimension of running the football that struck didn't but he he definitely turned it around then the second half he threw a couple beautiful throws a third and goal touchdown pass and then he also connected on another long pass downfield uh i felt the same way that that turned the game around when they went to him he's a red shirt freshman started out at southern miss you know he, he's a Probably going to get better and better with Petrino because coming out of high school, he was recruited by Georgia and Indiana and some big time schools. So, you know, there, there's some there's some talent there. Hey Bob, obviously uh, for Youngstown State, the guy that has been the the engine that runs the offense, Jalil McLaughlin. What a spring this young man has put together, uh, and the fact that he has two years of eligibility left. 
uh, this is some serious comfort for Youngstown State. They've they've got a nice staple of running backs, and we saw Dre Rushton uh, score a touchdown late in the game. Uh, Dre has uh, the ability to uh, to to spell McLaughlin. Uh, a couple of other kids uh, could uh, could certainly come into the game if if Jalil needs a break, but. Uh, running back is certainly not going to be a problem for Youngstown State the next couple of years. Yeah, no, no question. They, they've got depth there. And we were mostly seeing Christian Turner. We saw a little bit of Pearson. That's the first we've seen extensive play by Rushton. He looked good. And from what I hear, he's a good receiver out of the backfield. And, uh, and we may see a lot of those guys this week. I, I did find out today that uh, Jalil got nicked up a little bit in that game uh, on Saturday. And right now he's probably questionable for Saturday. So if he can't go... We're going to need Rushton and Turner and um, some of those other guys, Pearson, to play. But no, there are stable backs. McLaughlin certainly has, has shown he is the number one guy, and he has clearly emerged as our back for the next two years. But you need some depth. You don't want him to have to carry 28, 30 times a game. And in this conference, you know, you're going to need some players back there. But I'd say Dre Rushton ran hard. Uh, looked like he definitely, you know, felt comfortable in the offense and. Uh, show that he can you know, catch the football, which he did on the six-yard touchdown pass. That is one area, Ron, where I think why he's in pretty good shape at running back. You know, this final game of the year kind of feels like to me like a fourth preseason game in the NFL where you really want your guys that are still question marks to really stand out in this game. And, of course, you want to win it. But this game's going to have immense impact on evaluation more than anything because – I think there are plenty of guys that might still have question marks going into next season that are really going to be evaluated based on this last game. Do you kind of get that sense too? Yeah, I do. I think uh, we're still trying to figure out wide receiver. Do we have the talent? Do we not? Do we need to get bigger? Do we need to get faster? Uh, Do we need to go in the portal? Uh, So I think there's some guys that would like to finish strong there. Um, Also think they're trying to to, to find on the defensive line, even though they've played eight, nine guys – is there maybe one guy that could maybe emerge as that dominant defensive lineman, which we haven't seen yet this year? So I think, that, yeah, there's a lot on the line. And also the ability to beat a good team in North Dakota and maybe knock them out of the playoffs. So I do. I, I don't think Wade will play, so I think it'll be Craycraft. And um, the other question is, would Crenshaw get some work at quarterback? I know he was uh, highly touted coming you know, out of high school, and the plan was that he wouldn't play this year. Uh, so I think there is a lot to play for this Saturday with North Dakota coming in. You know, Bob, I, I was going to ask, obviously Mark Wade's uh, injuries are such where he's not going to play on Saturday. And while you do have the respect factor of trying to beat North Dakota, trying to deny them an opportunity to go into the playoffs, trying to give Missouri State every opportunity to at least share a conference championship, assuming South Dakota State can upset North Dakota State, Youngstown State also wants to be able to, you know, uh, have some kids play uh, with live bullets. And, you know, you brought up Crenshaw's name. I'm I'm thinking Mitch Davidson, who uh, who played high school football at Salem. Uh, there's another kid that, you know, I'd, I'd kind of like to see what the Penguins have with this uh, with this guy. And I'm I'm wondering if coach is going to say, hey, um, you know, Joe Craycraft is our guy today, uh, but. We're going to throw a couple of these other kids if the game gets out of hand. It might happen. You're right. And now would be the time to do it, to give them some playing time, to get something on film and game conditions. Um, so it could be Davidson. It could be Crenshaw. I asked Coach last week who would be the backup. He goes, it depends. And I think, you know, if we were leading and we needed more of a running quarterback, it might have been Crenshaw. If, if Joe Craycraft would have got injured and we had to throw the ball, maybe it would have been Davidson. I think they feel he throws it a little bit better. I also think, Ron, a bigger question, too, going into the offseason, will YSU look in the portal and maybe if someone's there that's a junior or senior at an FBS program that wants to transfer, that's ready to play, would they pull the trigger on going and getting a veteran quarterback for next year knowing that, you know, Wade's just going to be a redshirt freshman? I I don't know. Maybe, I think I'll ask Coach Phillips that tonight. I think there's still – um, a good feeling about the quarterback position of Mark Wade, but there's also some uncertainty that that he's he's not clearly established himself uh, as a number one guy. We, you know, when you're throwing for about 60, 70 yards a game on average, that's not going to cut it next fall if we're going to get better. Uh, you know, 
I, I'm going to say something that is probably going to be unpopular uh, on the north side of Youngstown, but uh, perhaps they should be looking in the portal for receivers who know how to catch the ball consistently because we didn't have that on Saturday. And as much as Joe Craycraft struggled uh, with some passes, he threw behind some guys, threw into the arms of some defenders on another occasion. His receivers did not help him in any way, shape, or form. There were some drop passes uh, that, that could have gone for some serious yardage on on Saturday. Yeah, agree 100%, Ron. In the, in the game where we tried to rally against Southern Illinois late, Mark let us downfield, and we had some drop passes there as well. So I I like to look at it more as an observation than a criticism, which I think is just what you made is, is, is accurate, that we, whether it's the current group, now Samuel St. Seren, who was hurt this spring, will be back next year, and I know they're hoping he can come back and have a big year. Uh, we're going to have to play a lot better at wide receiver. Uh, a lot of the games where fans would, you know, ask me about why is they, why are the quarterbacks holding the ball? Why can't we throw? Uh, the receivers weren't open. So if they're not open, the quarterback either has to take a sack or throw the ball away. So we, we do need to, I think that's the one specific area where there needs to be a vast improvement next year, wide receiver. And one of the positives I think about Mark Wade going forward is, you know, all the points you made are true. You know, he hasn't established himself numbers-wise. But when you watch how the team just responded to him when he took over that starting role and how much the offense kind of came alive, and and he, he's got to be kind of a spark in the locker room and, and kind of a, a guy that the guys, for one reason or another, get behind. And that's going to be a, a major stepping stone for him going forward. Uh, trying to fight for this starting role at quarterback. I think he has, Anthony, I think you're right on that. He has the respect of all his teammates because he works hard. He's, well, it's like a cliche, but he is the first one in, last one out, puts a ton of time into it. It's it's not for lack of effort. It's not for lack of preparation. Um, everybody wants Mark to be the guy and succeed and win, and he's still young. Uh, he'll be still a redshirt freshman next year because of COVID. He'll be his third year in the program, uh, but be a redshirt freshman. So I still think there's a real high ceiling on Mark, and he has a chance to win. Um, so maybe it's that combination. You know, you get another year with Mark Wade, and you get better play a wide receiver, and then all of a sudden maybe we are throwing for you know, 175, 200 yards a game. So I think it's the combination, too, of receiver and, and quarterback. And I've also had, you know, some – Football fans, I respect, say, you know, our game plan's conservative. We don't open it up. I think they would like to open it up more, but maybe the weapons just aren't there yet. So I think we will in the fall see a more open offense and, and maybe try to take more shots downfield. You know, and interestingly enough, and, and we've talked about the, the transfer portal, and it's gone both ways. I mean, the basketball program has lost some kids. Uh, now they're starting to gain some kids from the transfer portal. The one problem for me for football season, look, I mean, it's a, it's a quick turnaround this year. Uh, you're, the last game for us is going to be on Saturday, April the 17th. In about four months later, these guys are going to be back on the field playing football in the fall of 2021. So it is a really, really quick turnaround. So whoever the Penguins attract in the portal, if they are to get some kids to come to Youngstown State, they're going to have to learn the playbook within four months in order for them to be effective uh, come the fall. And and that is uh, that's another part of this that is going to be challenging, to say the least. Yeah, no spring football to go through, Ron. You're going to come out into camp and be ready to play in a month against Incarnate Word, who sounds like a you know who's that? Well, they were they're three and two. They're not a bad team. We open with them on a Thursday, then nine days later, Michigan State. So there there isn't going to be that opportunity that you normally would have to get ready for a season. So even Jaleel McLaughlin, who started slowly. Uh, I think it took him a while to get comfortable and used to the offense, and once he did, he took off by game three. Uh, it, it's not a year right. They'll have about the same amount of time that the mid-year transfers had to get ready, and that's not much, maybe a month or so, really, in game-like conditions. And then, you know, not much time to get ready, to, but also one of the things that people don't think about as fans is you got to get acclimated to the to the campus and to the – the classes you're going to take and the the culture of the team, there's a lot that you're not going to have a lot of time to really get acclimated for. Um, 
for the incoming players this year. I think that's something that, that fans and, and coaches and everyone just kind of have to to understand a little bit that, that there's not going to be as much time to get acclimated. A lot of Zoom recruiting, and Grant Dixon's a good example. He's a senior linebacker. He was recruited all by Zoom, not just here, everywhere. He never saw Youngstown State till the day he arrived for the first day uh, of classes. Uh, he, when he was recruited, and normally you come, you see facilities, you meet coaches, you look at the weight room, uh, you get a feel for if this fits for me. He committed to Youngstown State, never seeing the campus, the stadium, the Watt Center. Uh, it was blind faith on both sides. Now, here's a guy that was at Marist, three-year starter, non-scholarship, uh, wanted to try to play at a higher level and also hopefully get some of his college paid for. But, I mean, that's what happened this year during COVID. The guys were committing, and it was all done by Zoom, uh, and never saw the campus and never saw, never met his teammates until he arrived for school. Yeah, it's it's an amazing process, and uh, 2021 fall portion of the schedule uh, is is going to be uh, uh, challenging to say the least, because uh, the the turnaround is not going to be that much, and we got a lot of work to do between now and August for certain. One game left to play. Uh, Penguins hoping to spoil the party that is North Dakota going to the FCS playoffs. Look forward to seeing you on Saturday, my friend, uh, and. Uh, Man, it's been a fun season, even though the wins haven't been there. It, it's been a fun year. And, and I would imagine that Coach Phillips uh, is preferring this over spring practice playing amongst yourselves. I, I think that for his first year, I think that he was, if, if you were to ask him if he prefers this uh, in his first year rather than trying to get everyone together to get a normal spring practice going i'm i'm almost positive he's willing to say this was a much better situation for him it is and and ron it's something i in fact i'll ask him tonight regardless of the record i'm going to think his answer is going to be i'll take this because i I have game conditions we got the coach games we got the prep we got to look at film i got my coaches and you know making calls in game conditions and boy how miserable would it have been if we wouldn't have played football the next fall all the time that new coaching staff would have had not playing any games until the fall. I think that would have been miserable. So I, I agree with you. I think playing games, despite not maybe the record we had hoped for, was a much better scenario than just going through the spring. Agreed. Bob, always a pleasure, sir. Look forward to seeing you on Saturday. Okay, see you, Ron. You Take got care. it. Bob, Bob Hannon, the uh, voice of the YSU football program, joining us on the MP Vivo Heating and Air Conditioning Hotline. See, I just did Hannon's job. He's going to have one of my questions uh, for the radio show, there you but go. He'll, he'll word it a lot more elegantly. Well, I'm sure he will. I mean, <laughs> mine was mine was uh, butchered all to hell. I mean, he's he's uh, a TV guy. He likes to, you know, they word things so much better, and they they uh, pontificate, pontificate so much better. Where um, you know, us people, we're just you know, butcher the hell you know, out of stuff. As the day has gone on, we have uh, cancellations that we can officially. Announced from today's and tonight's uh, softball baseball can games. We, uh, can we uh, use that as a tease and say we'll be back with the cancellations? Well, after, you're the host. If you tease it, out. I can't do much about it. You can click commercial. Well, wait and I can well, just wait be a like, second. You cool. make it. What is it? You make it sound like I'm I'm an Egyptian with a with a gun in my hand, saying that I'm uh, I'm hijacking the airplane. Whoa! Uh, I mean, whoa! Uh, that's not that's not where we're going here. Whoa. You know, I mean, uh, I was just suggesting whoa. that whoa. perhaps we could use this as a tease. <laughs> you need to slow way down. Yeah, I know. I was that was kind of uh, that was kind of bad. <laughs> Uh, I'm just saying. Break. <laughs> now. All right, we're going to take a time out, and then we are going to uh, go through the softball and baseball cancellations. Anthony has got if we're not fired on the break. A, a ton of them. Uh, that's coming up after this time out on uh, YSNlive.com. Your teams work hard and give it all they've got. Well, so does ours, because 21 Sports and YSN give you extra effort when covering local sports. 21 Sports and YSN, winning coverage of our Valley's teams. No matter what the weather, be prepared with a reliable, efficient, rude gas furnace or air conditioner from MP Vivo Heating and Air Conditioning. Call your energy-efficient expert, MP Vivo, today for a free estimate. Here at MP Vivo, we rely on rude, and so should you.
Myers Family Insurance knows the importance of a great team. Our team continues to grow to help you with your Medicare and retirement needs. The annual election period is October 15th through December 7th. Now's the time to make sure your plan continues to meet your needs for the upcoming year. Call today. It's storm season. I think we're under the gun for some heavy storms over the next couple of hours. And Storm Tracker 21 is ready. This is probably the one we're keeping a closer eye on. On air. And locally, we're going to have a lot of eyes on our area. Online. All right, let's talk high risk future cast and the timing of this weather. On social media and on our app. Notice we'll have scattered showers on Thursday. Stay ready with Storm Tracker 21. The severe weather threat now through around sunset. Your first and last stop with your tax return should be with me, Tracy Bryden at Greenwood Chevrolet in Austintown. No other dealer goes the extra mile to bring you the largest selection of vehicles at one convenient location. With guaranteed credit approval, I will find you the right vehicle and the right financing options for you. I am ready to go the extra mile to show you why no other dealer sells more cars, finances more, and gets you more for your refund than Greenwood Chevrolet in Austintown. Welcome back to a Monday edition of Running Point presented by Greenwood Chevrolet on Mahoning Avenue in Austin Town. Good God, we have fun during the uh, during the breaks. Um, we shouldn't. <laughs> um, All right, as promised, so, uh, we do have uh, softball and baseball cancellations due to the inclement weather. Anthony, the the floor is yours, sir. Here are the ones that are official as of now that you can you know put it in Sharpie. These are canceled. Um, uh, EP, uh, uh, these are all softball. We'll start with softball. EP hosting Lisbon has been moved to the 14th of April. Um, Camel versus Liberty, which is Wednesday, by the way. Camel versus Liberty has been moved to the 13th, which is tomorrow. Um, Springfield versus McDonald has been moved to Wednesday. Uh, Poland hosting South Range has been moved to Wednesday as well. Um, Jackson Milton versus Sebring has been uh, canceled. The, 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 day, the makeup date has been, hasn't been announced yet for softball. Those are the only softball ones that have been official as of now. Uh, as far as baseball, we have every game at scene is canceled. So that includes Ursuline-Salem um, and uh, Louisville and Waterloo. So those games are canceled. Uh, LeBray versus Newton Falls canceled. East Palestine and Lisbon has been moved to the 14th, which is Wednesday. Uh, Poland and South Range, just like the softball game, moved to Wednesday as well. Uh, Jackson Milton and Sebring is canceled. And then Lowville versus, what is Low, oh, Louisville, sorry. Louisville versus Maslin Jackson has been moved to Thursday. So those are the ones that are official as of now. You can stay tuned to YSN for... Um, more coverage on who's canceled and who's not as the day goes on. Yeah, today is a uh, hit and miss day. Uh, you know, there could be some showers in, in certain parts of the area. Other parts of the area may just have gloomy skies and really chilly temperatures. And uh, it's just not an ideal day to play baseball. Not that uh, tomorrow's going to be absolutely gorgeous, but not temperature wise all week. It's going to suck. Uh, it, you know, as far as the, as far as the temperature goes, Especially the entire like, week is going to be garbage. I love doing games at South range. Don't get me wrong, but that field is wide open. There's not anything to break the wind out there Yeah, uh, at the softball field. So when you go out there, you're about 10 degrees colder than, than whatever the, the thermometer says. So tomorrow I'm at South Range, and I'm going to be in layers. Let me just tell you that. Uh, yeah, because, mid-high because 50s all it's week. It's going to be mid-high 50s, but when you're, uh, when you're at a field that is always windy no matter what, it's going to be like low 40s. That's what it's going to feel like. So, well, and, and especially come for a team that is coming back from a gorgeous trip right. to a really warm climate such as Myrtle Beach, this is going to be... This is, might, gonna kinda, might, this is gonna kind of be tough. They might call up, be like, "We're just gonna stay on the beach for another week. You guys can go uh, go yeah. about your business." Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna uh, we're, we're gonna staying. learn we're gonna learn while we're on the beach here. We're taking, staying taking we're a staying. lot of marine biology courses here for the next week. Virtual learning. We're staying. <laughs> How many people want to be marine biologists? And right here, coach. Okay, we're we're staying. We're staying. <laughs> we're staying. Yeah. 
We're, we're going to dig up Jacques Cousteau's body, and he's going to teach us some things of uh, the undersea world, and, and and go from there. We had they had a really good weekend at, at Myrtle Beach, though five and one on the on the week for them. Um, no, the guys had a pretty good. The guys week had as a well. good week too. After losing, I think I think they lost their first game, and then won every other game um, after that. So. Guys had a good week. Girls had a good week, and now they're coming back trying to get right into any eight play. And uh, you know, both of them with pol- matches up, matches up against Poland right off the bat. So yes, we'll see. Yeah, it's uh, it'll be fun to uh, it'll be fun to watch. But you know, again, the weather is going to dictate which games are going to be played, which and games are not going to be played. That's and- the reality of softball, baseball. I mean, everyone knows that. Everyone knows the weather in Northeast Ohio, and and you grade accordingly. Um, luckily, the Wednesdays are left open with most of these conference teams, so they can just move it to Wednesday. We hopefully. were spoiled in a big, big way last week, pretty much. Right. I mean, that, that's, you know, most that of the was, week that last week was, was amazing. Outside yeah. of Thursday, where I felt like I was going to be in a tornado at Crestview, because <laughs> I'll tell you. Uh, no, I'm not, you've been to Crestview softball, right? You've been uh, it's, to that field? it's right next to the Where, right next to the baseball so stadium. They had me behind home plate, which is fine. It's fine, but you have to go up a hill. Yeah, and then you're well, so I'm I'm on the hillside almost. Yeah, because there's not really it doesn't level. It's just like a big yep. hill, and it doesn't level until you get to the, yep. the. So I'm on this hill, and they give me like a, a table from the shed that's not exactly. The most stable table in the yeah. stable table. Yeah. So it's shaking a little bit. And, and it's it's dreary the whole game, but it never rains from the first inning all the way until after the top of the seventh. I go into commercial break. The wind starts to really pick up. Not raining yet, mind you. So I go back on the broadcast. First batter. That wind's picking up. The, the camera goes, whoop. <laughs> <laughs> so the cam- I have to catch the camera, put it back, and then as soon as I put the camera back, the rain starts to come down really hard. The wind is going. Yeah. That table's doing this. Yeah. And my wheelchair, which is locked, starts to shh down the hill. That's when I said we're out. <laughs> we have to miss the bottom of the seventh inning. I hope Crestview doesn't walk it off because I'd be really upset to miss that. Yeah. Uh, and, and we just got – all the equipment out of there as fast as possible because the rain hit out of nowhere. We, we were going to stay for the wind because wind isn't going to hurt our equipment. I mean, we might have to hold it steady. Sure. But once that rain, it came out of nowhere like, bam, pouring. And I was like, Ooh. Yeah, out. You know. That's it. And then um, Saturday was beautiful, but it was windy at Poland. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were right behind home plate in that press box at Poland. We got hammered by dirt. Like I had to, Saturday night. I so spent, the wind was blowing straight in. I, Saturday night, I spent like two hours cleaning and blowing out the equipment to make sure there was no dirt settling in the. <laughs> because everything was covered. Yeah. I, mean, I came out of that looking like I just went through a, a sandstorm. Yeah. Um, so, you know, hey, you take what you get. No, listen, it's uh, the weather. We've been spoiled. Uh, most of the weather this year has been really nice. It's been in the high 60s, low 70s, just gorgeous, gorgeous weather that you would expect in late April, early May. Uh, we're a few weeks ahead. Now we're back to where we normally are, which is mid-50s, a little chilly. We don't see the sun, uh, which makes it really that much worse. And, Doesn't and, this make Monday twice as hard? When uh, it's like it does. It, it definitely does. So uh, there will be... Uh, there, there will be a lot of cancellations today. There, there may be some teams that will get we, their games in. We have our fingers crossed for Fitch because Fitch has that turf field that's supposed well, to be able it, Yeah, the only way they get canceled is if it pours down rain or a lightning. Right. That's so. the only way because you can play in a steady rainfall at Fitch. Because it's it's artificial turf. I mean, you're, you're not going to damage anything because right. the entire field, including so. the batter's box, which is weird, uh, but all of that is turf. So you can you can play on that. I first time I umpired with on that, I was like, "This doesn't feel right." What? The, this is weird. You don't really you don't need cleats. No, you you can't wear cleats you on can't that. Can't wear cleats. No, 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 no. They they not only frown on that. <laughs> They throw people out if you wear you cleats. Out. You, you don't even think about putting that on. Yeah. Uh, not in our field. That's you wear shoes that don't have cleats. You know, no spikes. That's gonna be that's gonna be real weird for someone that like. Especially we talked to to Steve Word in, earlier this year, and 
They have a turf field at the softball complex too. Teams that come from playing in dirt that all of a sudden have to adjust to how the ball reacts off this turf. The spin. How it's going to you know bounce. And also running. I mean, you're not in cleats anymore. Running in cleats is different than running in shoes. Yep. And you got to get used to all that. It's a lot easier to make the transition from dirt to turf mm-hmm. than it is turf to dirt. And he said it. They have the practice facilities at the the sort of dirt field that they're able to practice on. Yeah. When they do have to go on the road, so they're ready for that. So, Fitch is spoiled with with um, an immaculate of blessings for their baseball oh, and softball God. team. Absolutely. I mean, the, the biggest difference playing in a turf field, if you're an infielder, the ball gets to you a lot quicker because the ball skips pretty quick on turf. Now, if if the ball is going up the middle and you've got to show off your range as a shortstop to your left, assuming that you're nobody's a left-handed shortstop. So you would be you would be going to your left up the middle. You better have some really quick wheels because again, the ball is going to skip really fast off that turf. It's a true hop. You're not going to get a bad hop on the turf, but it's going to go instead of a normal out, a, a normal slower hop in in on the dirt outfield too. I mean, if it, if it, if someone laces a single into the outfield and then takes one hop, you better hop's hurry. not gonna not gonna bounce like it does for a grass field. Yeah, a line drive into the alley. You better hustle your butt and over to the alley to cut it off. Just like the old turf fields in MLB, I guarantee it's triple mania if that ball gets in the corner. Oh, absolutely. Because it can hit the corner and then just roll right across. Yeah, that's the- it. <laughs> that's it. You hit a line drive hard enough up the alley, it's going to go all the way to the wall. Mm-hmm. And, and that's when the fun begins. Uh, it's- you know what's crazy? The Poland field, I didn't notice it until Saturday. In rates, there's like it's it's an incline. It's not leveled. Interesting. So they have a little. What was the Astro Hill called? Oh they yeah, have, over at Minute Maid, where you have, had to where you had to climb <laughs> that hill, and you, you looked like you would. Oh, this is level four in a in a walking machine now. I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> so so Poland has their own little uh, little Astro Hill out there in right field. There you go. Nothing wrong with that. They're hoping to get a, a field at the school pretty soon. I think. Uh, Aiming for next season to have a well, softball have a, field. Well, oh, yeah, the, the softball field they need to they need to have it at the at the field. It's um, at near the school. The baseball field, uh, I umpired there last week. That is a gorgeous baseball field. Oh, I I I was in awe of it. I was like, yeah, yeah this is pretty nice. Now you got to walk a ways uh, as an umpire because you park the car in the uh, parking lot. Uh, and then you got to walk a little ways, a little further uh, than most places. But uh, it's it's a beautiful facility. So far in my travels around the area this season, I've really liked West Branch's softball facility. It's it's is really, it near the high school? It's a little bit of a trek. It's mm-hmm. you, you, when I, when we parked, we had to walk down this gravel road, uh, a little a past a track. It's like behind the track, uh, but it's 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 got bleachers all the way around the the out, the home. Behind home, uh, it's got a nice PA system. Nice, it looks pretty. It's got a nice scoreboard bat out in center field. Nice big scoreboard. It's, it's a nice place. Are, are we doing a uh, baseball and softball review in terms of at the end of the season? In terms of Let's fields, end nah. of the season when uh, I get to. Yeah, we could do that. Yeah, we could definitely and do Ursland that. Ursuline gets spoiled because they get to play at YSU. Well, and that's I mean, not that's, fair. I mean, look, I mean that, that's, I mean that's a Cadillac that that's driving up the uh, up the street. You're just, you know, you can't compete. They're, they're just, they're just like, yeah, you it's can't like, compete with that stuff. And they got Gray Poupon in their uh, in their uh, glove box. You can't compete with that stuff. I mean, that's you know, uh, from high school stuff. I, look, the baseball field at Crestview is nice, but I will. What I have said about Crestview... You're right. It got dark really quick. Oh, it does. It, it, if there's no... If, if it's a cloudy day in Crestview, I don't know why I this is. I think it's... A, it, well, at least the softball field, it's like dense and tall trees right here. Yeah. That's already blocking light. Yeah. So I got to imagine that has something to do with it. Probably does. I, mean, I wonder if you could chop all those trees down and then say, okay, let, let there be light. But... I think someone uh-huh. someone maybe get a little be uh, the squir- disappointed. The squirrels would be upset. Uh, I think they would have picket signs going, "You're not going to steal our home," or they would go, "You must be nuts. You're not taking our nuts." Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> 
Don't take our tree, you nut. <laughs> Why the hell we find my nuts? Uh, God. Uh, so I've been to Poland this year. I've been to Crestview this year. You've been to Canfield. I've right? been to Canfield. Canfield gets busy when there is a softball track and baseball event going at the same time. Oh dear God, is that place a zoo? Because they had the Canfield girls were playing a softball game, I believe against. Uh, I want to say Ursuline they were playing. Uh, the junior high track was going on, and the freshman baseball team was playing. Um, uh, Cuyahoga Heights? No, not Cuyahoga Heights. Who the hell were they playing? One of the one of the Cleveland schools, and all of this was going on at the same time. I mean, the parking area was a zoo. It, it was a it was an absolute uh, uh, just asses to elbows with people. I mean, it was uh, it was a lot of people, so it, it can it can get congested pretty quickly. But I do like Canfield's facilities, and I like Boardman's uh, baseball field too. It's it, that's a uh, that's a nice uh, ballpark, and uh, whoever came up with Field of Dreams and yes. that complex, dear God, is that complex gorgeous? Yeah, that is a just a phenomenal, yeah. phenomenal place. You know, I, um, the the Canfield girls at least have their own field at school, but McEwen Park in Canfield is also one of those complexes that's really well put together. Yeah, been there for travel ball over the summer. Absolutely. So. Absolutely, they some, and they're able to host some really big tournaments because of it. Yeah, and and they get up into Trumbull County, and uh, the um, I haven't the been complex to, in Warren up there is gorgeous. Candlelight. I haven't, I haven't been to Champion yet for for softball, but I, I wonder what their field is like. I'm excited to get to Champion you at would, some point. You would think it's going to be immaculate, I hope, just I hope like they the put, program. You know, I hope I hope they have some flashiness to their softball field. Wow. <laughs> Good. <laughs> You're just you're just throwing lightning strikes all over the place right now. Uh, yeah, this this the whole pun, <laughs> this whole penitentiary stuff by uh, Anthony started off. Uh, I want to say was... Thursday, where he started uh, roaring these puns all over the place and you know, trying to trying to slow down the puns here, and, and it's not happening. <laughs> Holy smokes! Uh, 330-886-0813, the MPV vote. <laughs> Heating and air conditioning hotline open for business. You're getting you're getting sent to the penitentiary. I, I couldn't resist. Yeah, I, yeah, that'll be your last words before we give you a life sentence in the penitentiary. I'm gonna, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Yeah, indeed. Uh, we'll take a final time out. Be back to uh, wrap this one up. Stick around. More to come. Your first and last stop with your tax return should be with me, Tracy Bryden at Greenwood Chevrolet in Austintown. No other dealer sells more cars, finances more, and gets you more for your refund than Greenwood Chevrolet in Austintown. WRS Wealth Advisors is the area's premier wealth and retirement specialist. With our combined 70 years experience and comprehensive wealth strategy, we assist our clients attain their goals. Call 330-965-0370 to learn more about our individual and corporate financial planning services or visit wrswealthadvisors.com. Good luck, athletes. Hi, everyone. This is DJ Yokely with Your Sports Network. We appreciate your support of YSN and welcome you to the YSN family. Our broadcast streams are brought to you live at no cost to you by sponsors that are local to this community. Without the vision and generosity of our sponsors and partners, we would not be able to bring this game to you today. So please support the great businesses and leaders that are making this game possible. And if you're a business in need of great advertising and sponsorship opportunities, feel free to head over to our site for more information on the right fit for you. We are local, we are loyal, and we are live. We are YSN. Ah, the details. Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods is one fine ride. Perfect cornering, superb handling, sporty and stylish, power to spare, plus awesome mileage. Yeah, jaw-droppingly beautiful lines and well-appointed with luxurious trim. Put more oomph in your life and start beholding the molding. 
Find your home's fine hardwood at BairdBrothers.com. For heating, cooling, and indoor air quality, the Mahoney Valley trusts MP Vivo Heating and Air Conditioning, offering worry-free repair, service, and installation. Call MP Vivo today for a free estimate. MP Vivo Heating and Air Conditioning. We're your energy-efficient experts. Planning a project around your home or rental property? Trust the electrical service to the local experts with 62 years of serving the Mahoning Valley. Joe Dickey Electric is your local go-to source for responsive, reliable residential electrical work. From everyday maintenance and repairs to new installations, electrical upgrades, and safety inspections, no job is too big or too small. Call Joe Dickey Electric today, 800-549-3976, or visit DickeyElectric.com. That's DickeyElectric.com. Welcome back to this Monday edition of Running Point presented by Greenwood Chevrolet on Mahoning Avenue in Austin Town. Anthony Hardwig looking to swing a bat. I'm just doing some some uh, pectoral stretches. Pectoral I stretches. You know, wow. get, getting getting the. Yeah, I, I think you were trying to show off your Kansas City Royals uh, official Major League Baseball jersey over there. Well, whose whose jersey is that? This by the is way, Alcides Escobar. Nice. Uh, from back in our World Series run. He uh, he Cole. is the best shortstop defensively I had ever seen in minor league baseball. Yeah, he made I, we, a, we call them El Mago yeah. in, in the Royals. He made a play um, in Huntsville, Alabama when he was still with the Brewers organization that my jaw dropped. His range to his left was always known as being pretty good. They had a ground ball up the middle, and actually to the right field side of the second base bag. Escobar comes flying out of nowhere, makes the grab a step to the right field side of the second base bag, turns his body, throws an absolute BB, and nails one of our guys by a half a step. And I'm like, look at this. And I'm like, how the hell did he just do this? That, ah. I think that the best play he ever made as a Royal, and it was in Cleveland, and I think Tom Hamilton even gave him uh, a lot of props for it. It was a pop-up in foul territory, and they had the shift on, so he was playing towards second base. And he ran from his spot all the way into foul territory to catch this ball on the dive. And the amount of ground he covered to get from there to, to the catch was yeah. just, I mean, it wasn't like a mile high pop up. It was, you know, it was your pop up into foul territory, but he was the only one over there because there was a shift. So he just whoop, he hightailed was, it over to foul territory. He was in the double A, um, he was in the Brewers double A farm team in Huntsville, Alabama when Sabathia was traded. Mm. Now, the deal that went down was Sabathia went to the Milwaukee Brewers, in exchange, the Indians got uh, a superstar that never became anything in uh, the outfielder that they uh, uh, that they picked up. Oh, God, and I can't remember his name. Uh, um, Laporta, Matt Laporta. It was like a three fifty hitter that year in the Southern League, and the Southern League was a pitcher's league. I mean, it was it was a pitcher's league. Laporte is hitting like 350, 360. This guy is raking. I mean, he is destroying everybody. But Laporta had an attitude problem. And the uh, Huntsville manager at the time, Don Money, former brewer, was more than happy to get rid of this clown because uh, he was just a pain in the ass to deal with. I was talking with the Indian scout because we were in Huntsville a couple of days before the trade deadline. And I said... So you're scouting some of the players for Sabathia deal. And he looked at me and I said, I'm an Indians fan. You know, he goes, yeah. I said, have you guys even approached the Brewers about Escobar? And the guy looks at me and says, Milwaukee won't, won't even hear of it. He's, well, they- he's that well respected in the organization. This was before... Milwaukee ultimately found out he couldn't hit his weight. That was um, that was the biggest trade in the I mean, in, maybe in Royals franchise history because we, I forget what we gave up, but the Brewers lost big. Yeah, because they gave us Escobar and Lorenzo Cain. Yeah, and we gave him. I think we gave them a pitcher that never really did anything for them. They they gave up on both of those guys because um, neither one of them could hit very well and, in the minor leagues. And Escobar never had a high average, but what I'll say about him is we put him in that leadoff spot, and one of those inexplicable baseball universe things, 
the Royals hit extremely well when Alcides Escobar was in the leadoff spot. Yeah. He wasn't a prototypical leadoff hitter. He was no. fast, but he didn't get on base a ton. He swung like crazy at everything. But for some reason, him in the leadoff spot worked. And and Ned Yost kept him there, and, and, and he got him all the way to the – I think he won the ALCS – MVP in 2015. He yeah, he did. Um, and then let off the World Series with a with a inside the park home run. I mean, it's amazing how fast he can go from that to where he is now, playing over in Japan. He's not even the he's not even in the MLB anymore. Yeah, he just couldn't hit. I mean, so, it, defensively, like I said, defensively, he went to his left better than any shortstop I've ever seen, not named Ozzy Smith, and, and that's saying something. Your your career can really you know go off really quick. I mean, yeah. I mean, he went from ALCS MVP. And, and World Series champion to not You're even... You're playing in Japan because right. you can't hit the ball. Right. And it's a, it's a damn shame. But back when Sabathia was traded, mm-hmm. the Brewers would not give any talk of trading Alcides Escobar. And to, to tell you how screwed up this whole trade was, Michael Brantley was the guy that the Brewers said, take him. He's, he's, he's the player to be named later. That's fine. Take him. He's not that great. Okay, then. Laporta turns into a hot pile of garbage, and Brantley turns into a superstar. Of the three, it's well, so, not even close who the best player of the three is. Well, so now I'm guessing you watch Lorenzo Cain as a minor leaguer, too. Yeah. And he, he, couldn't probably, hit it, he couldn't hit his way out of a and, paper bag. And he hit really well in the major leagues. Exactly. And, and it's just like... Was he as electric and center, though, defensively? As he, he, was, was, I mean, he was pretty good. He covered a uh, he, he was a pretty good. ground in center field. Yeah, he, he was pretty good. But, uh, God, Escobar was hands down the best shortstop I had ever seen. It was real fun watching the, the Indians games in that when it was Escobar at short and then Lindor at short. Yeah. Which were probably the two best defensive shortstops in the American League at that point. I saw Lindor play three games in Akron um, and broadcast his games um, when the Erie broadcaster was sick and he told me to uh, do the three games for him because he knew that I lived in the in the area. And I did the three games and someone asked me, and they go, what do you think of Lindor? I said, he's ready. I said, he's just, you know, his bat will catch up. He's ready. He's, he's ready to go defensively. He was pretty good, but he wasn't an Escobar good. The, Alcides Escobar is the best, going to his left, he's the best shortstop I have ever seen other than Ozzy. And that's saying something. He was better one, than Vizquel going up the middle. One, one gold glove. Yeah. So. It, it's, and he just couldn't hit. That's, couldn't at, hit. At the end of the day, he couldn't hit. All right, that'll do it for the show. Uh, many, many thanks for the phone calls. We will do it again uh, tomorrow, noon to 3. Uh, uh, Tuesday edition of Running Point. Stick around. Power Hour is coming up next. DJ and the fellas will take you through the 3 o'clock hour. We'll be back.